Interestingly, David Icke's story starts with a woman named Alice Bailey. Some of the following information on Alice Bailey is taken from the excellent research of Terry Melanson, the founder and webmaster for ConspiracyArchive.com. He writes, Alice Ann Bailey was a leading disciple of the Russian theosophist Madame Helena Blavatsky, the founder of Theosophy. Bailey formed the Lucifer Publishing Company in 1920, and in 1922, she saw the organization's name change to Lucius Trust, though the advancement of the Luciferian beliefs remained true. Lucius Trust promulgates the work of a, quote, ascended master, a spiritual being who was working through or in Alice Bailey for some 30 years. The Lucius Trust Publishing Company and their many fronts carry out the work of a Luciferian, quote, master plan for the establishment of something they call the Age of Aquarius. Lucius Trust is a powerful institution that enjoys consultative status with the United Nations, which permits it to have a close working relationship with the UN, including a seat on the weekly sessions, but most importantly, influence with powerful business and national leaders throughout the world. Through its founding of World Goodwill, Lucius Trust is, quote, aggressively involved in promoting a globalist ideology. Bailey's influential occult organization is tied to an international conspiracy of elitists like the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderbergs, and the Trilateral Commission. A spirit that called itself Dejwa Kool wrote many books through her. These included a plan that detailed many aspects of a world government that she called the New World Order. Quotes like, In a preparatory period for the New World Order, there will be a steady and regulated disarmament. It will not be optional. No nation will be permitted to produce and organize any equipment for destructive purposes or to infringe the security of any other nation. She actually outlines the process of how to prepare humanity for the New World Order in a section of her book, Externalization of the Hierarchy, called Steps Towards the New World Order. In another section called The Problem of Government, she appears to lay out the plan that would later become the basis for the Trilateral Commission by outlining how to divide the world into three blocks. But first, she states this, Coming now to the realm of government under the New World Order, one is faced with a very complex situation. Various basic trends of thought are appearing which, in the New World Order, will unfold in that major synthesis so much desired by the spiritual hierarchy of the planet. In addition to being one of the founders of the ideals and philosophies of those planning global governance, her writings also gained immense fame with another people group, that is of the so-called New Age. Her extensive writing served as the foundational beliefs of the New Age movement to this day. David Icke in recent times seems to agree with this. He said in his book, The Biggest Secret, quote, Two organizations spawned by Alice Bailey's work, the Lucius Trust and the World Goodwill Organization, are both staunch promoters of the United Nations. He also says, Alice Bailey founded the Arcane Esoteric School. She claimed a channel, an entity she called the Tibetan, and she produced a number of books including Hierarchy of Masters, The Seven Rays, A New Group of World Servers, and New World Religion. Bailey said that her Tibetan master had told her the Second World War was necessary to defend the plan of God. That sounds ridiculous to me, but there are many in the New Age field who believe that everything is a part of the plan and the will of God, even a global holocaust. It's impossible to understand why David Icke teaches the things that he teaches these days without first reading two of his now out-of-print books. His first book, Truth Vibrations, which he still mentions on his website, but says that they're out of stock, and his next book, Love Changes Everything, which he doesn't even have listed on his website at all. Before we get into the details of this very important material, you should know a little of the history of each book. Truth Vibrations was published in 1991, and Icke will refer to it from time to time. And although he admits his views have changed slightly, he still agrees with much that is in the book. Then there's his next book, Love Changes Everything. And unlike Truth Vibrations, Love Changes Everything was written after his Kundalini spiritual awakening in Peru, where Ike says that his mind was blown. And because of this, Ike says he doesn't like that book at all. He says, quote, I don't like that book because it was written at the most extreme time of my transformation, when I wasn't sure what planet I was on, never mind what my name was. The problem with trying to distance himself with these books is, as we will see, it's obvious that he still believes their main points. We will see countless examples of this in his recent talks and his recent books. And once you see the details of his early beliefs, it will become very clear that they are the same beliefs that are behind Alice Bailey and the New World Order. The first clue that there was a connection between Ike and Alice Bailey came only a few pages into Love Changes Everything, where Ike says, 
Since the publication of The Truth Vibrations, I have learned so much more as I have communicated almost daily with Rakorsky, the one known as Lord of All Creation, who is directly responsible for the changes the earth will undergo. I also communicate often with the one we know as Jesus, the Spirit of the Earth, and many others. Now, keep in mind that this Rakorsky is the same spirit that dictated much of his first book, The Truth Vibrations, back when the I first appeared. He says on page 21 of The Truth Vibrations, quote, Soon after this, the I appeared. One evening I was lying on my bed in a hotel room when I closed my eyes, and there, forming out of the darkness, was the shape of an eye. It was there for a split second at first before dispersing, but gradually it became permanent. Listen to Ike in this early interview when he talks about these entities. And one great example of the way this works I came across, which the, the, the beings, which we, we call the guys, uh, told us about. You call them the guys? The, gu the guys, yeah. It's, mm. it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's not... Um, it's not but the beings like... Uh, uh, Ataro, Rakowski. Rakowski and yeah, yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. Now, he was uh, Jesus' father, Rakowski, that's and, right. and Merlin he, as well. Part of him was, yeah, yeah. that's right, uh, the aspects. Now, although there's a lot to talk about from that clip, the thing that I want to focus in on is the being's name, Rakorsky. In Theosophy, Rakorsky is one of the Ascended Masters. These are the beings that are supposedly so evolved that they have transcended the physical realm, and now they are helping humanity pass through a coming age of enlightenment. Rakorsky was a particular Ascended Master that Alice Bailey wrote extensively about. It is especially significant that Ike calls him the Lord of all creation, and elsewhere, as we will see, the Lord of civilization, and says that he is, quote, directly responsible for the changes the earth will undergo, because these are absolutely clear examples that he is referring to the same ascended master that Alice Bailey made prominent, as she gave him those exact titles and said that his task was to establish the new civilization of the age of Aquarius. She also connected him with the so-called Seventh Ray, which will become incredibly significant as the story unfolds. It was only later, while reading the Truth Vibrations, did I find that he actually confirmed my suspicion that he was, in fact, talking about Bailey's Ascended Masters. In a section where he was talking about the different messages he received, he said, Some of the communications came directly from the consciousness which has the awesome responsibility for easing in and guiding the new age of Aquarius, the Lord of Civilization, and the Lord of the Seventh Ray, one of the energies we will soon be receiving at a much increased power. He continues, the universe is governed and guided by a massive hierarchy, and the person or consciousnesses are selected purely by a soul's stage of evolution. There are beings that guide the cosmic, galactic, solar, and planetary systems, planets, countries, and regions. Each one of these systems is broken down into further levels of organization. At the head of our solar system is the solar logos, working with the lords of the rays who control the energies that affect consciousness and spiritual development of life forms. These have become known as the Ascended Masters, and they are supported by other Ascended Masters behind the scenes, as it were. One of the best ways to demonstrate that David still holds these theosophical views today is with David's view of the so-called Solar Logos. As we just read, David believed that there was a literal sun god called the Solar Logos, and that the Solar Logos was going to be the entity that would send the energy to raise our consciousnesses and to make us, well, godlike. In another place, Ike says that Rikorsky told him that, quote, the Solar Logos is the spirit of the sun who guides the solar system and sends certain energies to the planet and the stars. He also goes on to say that the Solar Logos can reach a, quote, immensely high level of understanding and that he or she can then evolve to be the Lord over several suns. When Ike said earlier, at the head of our solar system is the Solar Logos working with the Lords of the Rays who control the energies that affect consciousness and spiritual development of all life forms, He's talking about how in Theosophy, it is the solar logos that is going to send the rays that are supposed to raise the consciousness of the earth. Alice Bailey's idea was that these seven rays would be generated from the galactic logos, whom she often referred to as the one about whom not may be said. These special rays would then be filtered through the sun god and then come to the earth to change us and the spirit of the earth, or Gaia. David very much believed in the Seven Ray Theory of Alice Bailey. In fact, in both of his early books, he not only gives lists for each ray and their characteristics, but he gives the exact characteristics for each one that Alice Bailey wrote. I will show you Alice Bailey's Seven Ray Chart on the screen, 
and I will read from David's book, Truth Vibrations. David begins, These rays are, 1. Pure will and power, Ray 2. Love and wisdom, Ray 3. Intelligence, Ray 4. Harmony through conflict, Ray 5. Concrete mind and science, Ray 6. Love and devotion, Ray 7. Law and order and ceremonial magic, the Rikorsky Ray. That last part is a dead giveaway because if you notice that Alice Bailey associated each ray to an ascended master, you'll notice that next to the last ray, the one Ike calls the Rikorsky Ray, is named Saint Germain. And that is what Bailey, and even Ike, would sometimes call Rikorsky. Bailey would also refer to him as Master R. One way to demonstrate how devoted Ike was to this idea of the seven rays is to point out that during this time, he would only wear the colors turquoise and light purple because certain colors were attributed to the different rays, and he believed it would attract more good vibrations to himself. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to ask Dave, um, is there anything special about that suit that he has on? He wore that on the table and showed up. The, the, the color turquoise? Yeah. You can answer that, David. If well, uh, this light, which the Bible talks of, this energy, this life force that is sent out from the Godhead and all around creation, and it's this life force around the planet that's been disrupted, um, has sub-frequencies within it. And each of those has a vibration, a frequency of a color. And turquoise is the color of an energy within that light known as love and wisdom. And if you wear the color that is on the same frequency, then you attract it and absorb it much more efficiently. And in case you think that he outgrew that, he posted on his website 11 years later a story defending his wearing turquoise back then. He would later modify his beliefs slightly. He said recently, Turquoise is an important color, but you don't have to wear it all the time. In more recent times, he confirms this belief in the rays that will cause an evolutionary shift. In his eighth book, And the Truth Shall Set You Free, he says, Cosmic rays of unprecedented power are being detected. These are the energies that are changing life on this planet. These cycles are fundamental, I believe, to the spiritual transformation and the multidimensional shifts which the planet and humanity are experiencing. Now let's get into why any of this matters to you, a truth seeker. Let me first quote Ike from his book, Robots Rebellion. He says, The sun is far more than a massive ball of fire generating warmth. It is another substation for source energies. The ancients knew this, or at least their most highly evolved members did. And this is one explanation for the origin of the sun god and sun worship. The more enlightened members of their number were not worshipping a ball of fire in the sky. They were acknowledging the solar logos, through which the knowledge and wisdom of the source reaches the planet. He continues, Just as the sun is the mind that guides the solar system, the galactic mind guides the galaxy and the universal mind guides the universe. Notice how he capitalizes these words like source and galactic mind. He's referring to the galactic logos from Alice Bailey, the one that she called the one about whom naught may be said. Notice how he talks about the worship of the sun in very good terms. That is, as long as you know what you're doing and know the esoteric truth about the sun, that it's actually the solar logos. After all, he says, these secret societies were just acknowledging the solar logos through which the knowledge and wisdom of the source reaches the planet. It's a very good thing, he says, to venerate the sun as long as you know what you're doing. We see him doing this exact same thing today. The only difference is that he doesn't use the word solar logos anymore. And as you watch these clips, notice the words he uses to describe the true worship of the sun. If you know David Icke, you know that he's using the best words in his vocabulary to present it in a good way. Words like vibrational. And one of the things that has come through history is the, the moon and sun religion. The religions, re religion using the symbolism of the sun and the moon, which has been uh, manifested as the sun god and the sun goddess. Now this has many connotations. On some levels it's worship of the sun, but on deeper levels, deeper levels of knowledge, these are symbolic of es deep esoteric and uh, vibrational, uh, mathematical, uh, geometrical concepts. It depends what level you, you, you're meeting the, the knowledge at, what level you have access to. Terry Melanson, founder of ConspiracyArchive.com, said the following about the Lucius Trust logo. Quote, the Lucius Trust logo features this streaming blue light. 
the New Age symbol invented by Foster Bailey, Alice Bailey's 32nd degree Freemason husband, has a plethora of symbolic imagery. The symbol, according to Lucius Trust, is, quote, set in a limitless field of blue, which signifies the sphere of life expression of our solar logos. Superimposed upon the triangle of New Age forces is the five-pointed star. In her book, Rays and Initiations, Alice Bailey reveals that the solar logos is Lucifer himself. Now, listen to Ike describe how the sun's rays are going to be the thing that causes the spiritual evolutions that he always says are coming. And listen carefully as he tries to work in the black hole in the center of the galaxy as being the source of this life-changing energy. And this is important because, as we will see, he has no scientific reason for saying that the black hole is going to send out any energy to the sun. But I think he does have a religious belief that Bailey's seven rays will come from the galactic logos and are then sent to the solar logos to transform humanity and the earth. And my, my feeling about this uh, awakening is that this is very, very much involved. I've got a, a lot more to do on this, to say the least, but I'm sure that the sun is far more than a source of heat. It is a place or a, 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 um, uh, an opening, a gateway, where great energetic change and code changes come into the solar system, same with others all around what we call the universe. And I, I'm, I feel that at the elite level, not among the general population, one of the focuses on the sun or the reasons for the obsession with the sun is the knowledge of this, um, right going back to the ancient world. I also feel that the, the black holes and stuff are also ways that these energetic codes come in and out of this reality. Is that what we're going through is, I talk there about this vibrational uh, base construct, um, which is uh, coming out of the black holes. That is now in the very powerfully in the process of changing its vibrational state. We're in this cusp between how it was the, the suppressed, the limited. Uh, uh. So as this um, energy changes, it's triggering different photon information uh, from from the suns. In this case, our sun, and so people are starting to those more open to it first are starting to decode a different. Um, base information construct and what that's doing is changing their perception as we decode it and move into a different era this vibration coming from the black holes is base vibration now this, there'll be more to know but I'm trying to put the themes here as it moves through its cycle um, of change before coming back to the original vibration it's changing the information coming out of the suns in the form of photons. It's changing the information construct. Therefore, we are starting to decode, as it moves through the cycle, different information. And i tell you the way I see it, anyway. Um, I, uh, what, I, what I'm saying in, in, in my new book is that um, the black holes, like the one in the center of this galaxy, are vibrating uh, the base vibrational state of this, this reality. But it's not stable in the sense that it doesn't just stay forever vibrating in the same way. It goes through a cycle. And so the, the, it goes through this, this vibrational cycle and eventually it comes back to the start. As, as the, this, the, the black holes vibrate this base vibrational uh, construct, this base vibrational foundation, it triggers information from the suns to be uh, transmitted in the form of photons, photon energy, which is information. As this vibration changes, and, and whoever created this virtual reality universe, in other words, this massively advanced computer game, they created this vibrational cycle. And as it goes through its cycle, the information coming from the suns in the photon energy changes. And so, it, we, and we're decoding these things, this change. So we go through periods of what the ancients called the golden age, when this massive expansion of awareness and connection and, and harmony and all the rest of it. And then there are other periods where um, the energy, the information is much more suppressed and limited and, 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 and these different cycles go on until it comes back from the start and the whole thing starts again. 
Now, I looked into his new book to see if he explained what this cycle was that the black hole was going through, because in running the website, the 2012deception.net, I feel I've heard just about every theory in which a cycle concerning the black hole and the sun is mentioned. Yet I've never heard of a vibrational base frequency that was part of a cycle or anything remotely similar, so naturally I was very curious to find out what scientific information he had to back up these claims. Because it seemed like he was just trying to make the theosophy idea sound really scientific. So I thought it was really funny when first I found that he never addresses this cycle at all in his new book. But what he did do was pretty hilarious. He actually put a picture of Carl Sagan on page 406 of Human Race Get Off Your Knees, and instead of quoting Carl Sagan, he quotes a woman named Carol Clark, who had a, quote, vivid dream where dead Carl Sagan spoke to her. This dream version of Carl Sagan is literally the only scientific support he has for this particular idea. It simply says on page 407, quote, Black holes resonate the frequency, and the different frequencies trigger different levels of information awareness to be emitted by the sun in the form of photons. So this dream version of Carl Sagan is the only evidence that Ike offers us to believe in this incredibly important theosophical idea about the sun god sending rays from the galactic god to change humanity. Even Ike's latest and greatest theories have their origins in his early writings, which in turn have their origins in Alice Bailey's writings. Take, for example, the subject of the moon. Ike claims he got the message from the spirit world regarding the moon. I sat down um, to start writing that day, and the energy in the room changed. I thought, I, I know this, I recognize this. The energy in the room changed. It was in a, there was a vibrational change. You could feel it. The atmosphere changed is a simple way of putting it. I, I recognize this. And um, what I then got as this, this was happening is the, 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 the basic first theme was the moon is not real. Of course, there's more to know about that and, uh, uh, as came, but the moon is not real. The moon is not what you think it is. He claims in his recent book that the moon is an artificial spacecraft, that the reptilians flew to our solar system, and once it came into orbit with the Earth, it caused major catastrophes. But what's worse is that it messed up the vibration so bad that it took us from godlike beings that could levitate and only had to eat energy instead of animals down to people who are like we are today, controlled by greed and anger, etc., there are several things very interesting about Ike's brand new theory. One of them is that it's not new for him at all. He describes the exact same thing in his book, Love Changes Everything, but with a slightly different flavor. He says, quote, Satan incarnated on the moon and helped to create fantastic negativity. The imbalance was such that the moon spirit left, and Lucifer, now rejoined in the light levels by Satan, used all the power of the negative energies and those created at the moment the spirit left to direct the dying, spiritless planet towards another planet. The light levels had known that Lucifer was planning on using the moon to create havoc, because his thought forms were passed directly to the Archangel Michael through the Devic information system and vice versa. Lucifer was thus aware of this and found a way to prevent the Godhead and Michael knowing exactly what he intended to do with the moon. He formed a very large number of plans in his mind, but did not decide which one he would go for until the last possible moment when he sent out one surge of negative energy that directed the dying moon towards Earth. The Archangel Michael said, There were a great number of possibilities, and we were in a waiting situation. Ike says that this, luckily, was happening right at the time of a scheduled axis shift at the end of the Atlantis civilization, and as a result, the sun god was putting forward a lot of positive energy at the time. He says, quote, Rikorsky said of the aftermath that the power of the solar logos' positive energy ray was enough to stop the moon from colliding with the Earth, but it became trapped in the Earth's orbit. Ike continues, the Earth's energy was in tatters, and if it were not for the Archangel Michael somehow keeping open some energy arteries to the main network, the planet would not have survived. I owe him much, the Earth spirit said, and his perseverance and positive attitude was wonderful for all of us. A spirit called Magnu, whom Ike still quotes at the end of his lectures, said the following on pages 61 and 62, quote, Land was torn in half, life was snuffed out in an instant and it was the start of what has become known as the cataclysm. There was water everywhere, tidal waves everywhere, land froze within minutes, great mountains of rock were wrenched out of the earth, areas of land sunk, 
just collapsed and disappeared. There were violent eruptions, devastating land shifts, and the sea came in. Doesn't this help you better understand what Ike is saying in this interview? For me, this period that people call Atlantis and Lemuria and talk of great cataclysms and stuff like that, um, that was probably the time when the hacking happened. There was a, a vibrational shift in a direction of limitation. My feeling is that, first of all, we had a much greater expansion of awareness, visual awareness, um, uh, hearing awareness, all the senses went much further out vibrationally and therefore we could access far more. When this shift of limitation took place because of these cataclysmic events, you can clearly see in the biological and geological record that this, this happened and of course you can see it in all the, the great flood and cataclysmic stories in all the native cultures around the world. When this, um, this happened, um, there was an energy deficit, and I feel that energy deficit is bridged by what we call food. You've got, you've got lions and other these, all, all these different animals all over the world, right down to the insects level of um, life, that basically every day is a killing field just to survive, because they are t taking in energy in a solidified form that energy deficit because of the energetic shift that took place. That's brilliant. This energetic flaw, this, this, this vibrational um, cataclysm did, was it took the, 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 um, the state of this reality, vibrational state of this reality, from harmony to disharmony, right? Now, hey, we're now um, decoding harmony, love, peace beauty. Suddenly there's a shift. Now we're decoding not that, we're decoding this. For the record, even the eating energy thing is from the book Love Changes Everything. On page 97 it says, with the energy system only at minimum levels, they could no longer live purely on energies in the water and the environment. They had to supplement these by consuming the energies in plant life. This is why we need to eat food now, to make up for the low energy levels in the world around us. Now here is the Alice Bailey connection. She has this to say about the moon. The moon chain has in itself a curious occult history not yet to be disclosed. Certain brief hints may be given for due consideration of students. The moon chain was a chain wherein a systematic failure was to be seen. It is connected with the lower principles. The sexual misery of this planet finds its origins in the moon failure. The progress of evolution on the moon was abruptly disturbed and arrested by the timely interference of the solar logos. This one would correspond exactly to Ike's story of the moon spirit being kicked out and the solar logos saving the day at the last minute. The secret of the suffering in the earth chain, which makes it merit the name the sphere of suffering, has its origin in the events which brought the moon chain to a terrific culmination. This next one from Alice Bailey is pretty important because it's at the heart of what Ike's current theory is. It says, Certain results, such as the finding of its polar opposite, were hastened unduly on the moon chain, and the consequence was an uneven development and a retardation of the evolution of a certain number of diva and human groups. Diva is a term that Bailey and Ike use to mean angels like Lucifer. The origin of the feud between the Lords of the Dark Face and the Brotherhood of Light, which found its scope for activity in the Atlantean days and during the present root race, can be traced back to the moon chain. So you can see that Ike's new moon theory is really just an expansion of Alice Bailey's writings on the moon. The next piece to this puzzle surrounds the idea of Gaia, or the Earth Spirit. David has been, and still is, very passionate about the existence of the Earth Spirit, what Alice Bailey calls the planetary logos. The spirit of the Earth is one of the most, is the most evolved uh, spirit ever to incarnate in a physical planet. She is a wondrous being of an evolution that we could not even begin to comprehend. And without that wondrous spirit and that high evolution, and the higher you go up in evolution, the more ability you have to love, 
the more ability you have for tolerance, the more of all these things you have. If she didn't have that, she would have left this planet a long time ago. When I said publicly um, in 1991 that the Earth was a living entity that we could communicate with and could communicate with us, uh, people uh, just dubbed me crazy. And now we're seeing scientists um, who have studied this coming to the same conclusion. Yes. No one did more to popularize the idea of the Earth spirit than Alice Bailey. It was her writing that influenced the Gaia religion of the United Nations, which will play an important role in the coming world government. A great example of this is a man named Robert Mueller. Robert Mueller was the author of the World Core Curriculum. He is widely recognized as the father of global education. For 30 years, he was Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. He was the Chancellor of the United Nations University. His ideas about world government, world peace, and spirituality led to the increased representation of religions in the United Nations, especially the New Age movement. He became known as the philosopher of the UN. He's the founder of Robert Mueller Schools, and the preface of the Robert Mueller School World Core Curriculum Manual, November 1986, says, The underlying philosophy upon which the Robert Mueller School is based will be found in the teachings set forth in the books of Alice A. Bailey by the Tibetan teacher Dejwa Kul. Robert Mueller told an audience in Costa Rica, We hear now of the Gaia hypothesis, of the interdependence of all inert and living matter, that we are part and parcel of a living planetary organism. Maurice Strong is another Gaia supporter. He was the founder and secretary general of the United Nations Environment Program and secretary advisor to Kofi Annan. He was the founder of the Earth Council and the Earth Charter Initiative and former president of the United Nations University of Peace. He is the author of most of the key United Nations environmental policies and plans, including Agenda 21, the Earth Charter, the Kaido Protocol, and the United Nations Report on Global Governance. He also founded the Manitou Institute, where various groups perform rituals to heal Gaia. This list can also include people like Al Gore and Ted Turner. So, I'm saying that there's a connection between Alice Bailey and the idea of Gaia, or the Earth Spirit, and the New World Order agenda. And to understand it, we should listen to a quote from David Icke about what the Earth Spirit does when people aren't ready to evolve. It says, quote, This is how the split in Atlantis occurred. And as it did so, the energy system and the roof of light became less powerful. The Earth Spirit decided, with guidance from Rikorsky and the Godhead, that rather than see such a wonderful people continue to fall down the frequencies, she would create the physical changes that would end Atlantis. Those who were still balanced enough to listen to guidance from the light levels would be led to places of safety during the changes. They would later return to restore the roof of light and to take care of the planet still further to even higher frequencies than she had yet reached. You can see that the Earth Spirit did not make this decision out of anger or resentment. Her motivation was love, just as it is today. Had she done nothing, these beings who had worked so hard to evolve up the frequencies would have continued to fall back again. But when she told the Atlanteans her decision, through thought communication, most of them didn't like it. This inability to understand the situation confirmed that the time was right to act. Although, according to Ike, this was cut short because of the moon being thrust into the Earth's atmosphere, this would not be the first time that Gaia had tried to commit an evolution-specific genocide, according to Ike. She also did the same thing to Lemuria, what he calls Mu, before it. He wrote, The energy system was in such a muddle that it threatened the Earth Spirit's ability to harmonize, and she decided to act to bring Mu to an end. If there comes a point when it's necessary to take action to maintain balance for everyone's benefit and check the imbalances that are harming the progress of all in her care, then it is her duty to act. Sometimes this can mean enormous changes that have to take place, but it's always done out of love and necessity, not malice. And according to Ike, the Earth Spirit then proceeded to kill everyone. And he still believes we are in danger, because the Earth's consciousness is too low. The only difference now is that the idea of the Illuminati has been incorporated as the ones making it happen. So, of course, the, the planet itself is a living, thinking, emotional entity. 
Um, and uh, we are interacting with that energy field. And one of the things the uh, Illuminati ha have set out to do and are trying um, ever more to do in the period we're experiencing now is to bring the vibrational state of the Earth's uh, field, the Earth's consciousness, to um, as low a point as they can. It's also important to understand that Ike's belief in Lemuria, or Mu, and Atlantis are derived entirely from theosophy, and he still very much believes in these today. In ancient, ancient times, prehistorical times, in terms of official history, where there were, it would appear, two great civilizations which made together a global civilization, one based on a landmass which has become known as Atlantis, and one uh, which has become known as Mu or Lemuria. And these were <coughs> advanced, very advanced civilizations with in many ways knowledge beyond what is available in the public uh, arena today. And they went uh, to great technological lengths, great understandings for instance in how you can create a magnetic field which then makes vast stones uh, basically weightless and you can push them along and maneuver them around. Great uh, technological advancement, at least among the elite. Now there's not a shred of evidence outside the Plato account about Atlantis. And the idea of Lemuria? Well, the main evidence for that is because Helena Blavatsky, the founder of Theosophy, simply said so. The idea of the sunken continent of Lemuria that Blavatsky describes has been proven an impossibility after the discovery of plate tectonics, which has led modern theosophists to concede that if Lemuria existed, maybe it was simply an era in time instead of an actual continent in light of this new evidence. Hitler and the Nazis also really liked theosophy. Hitler was said to have kept a copy of The Secret Doctrine by Helena Blavatsky by his bedside. The swastika of the Nazis was used because of its use by Blavatsky as her symbol for theosophy. The genocide that Hitler imposed was rooted in the theosophical view of the tall, blonde-haired, blue-eyed root races from Atlantis. And actually, Ike believed this too. He says on page 46 of Love Changes Everything that the inhabitants of Atlantis were an average height of 6 foot 5, blonde-haired, and skin that glowed white. Ike himself remarks about the incredible influence that theosophy had on Hitler in this way. He says, quote, I'm not saying that Blavatsky was negative, only that Hitler was influenced by her work. A few other similarities is that Hitler also believed in this idea that the moon came into our orbit and thus gave the need to create this new evolution. He also believed, like Ike, that the earth was hollow. Which is funny because in Ike's book, The Biggest Secret, when he talks about this, his main evidence for the hollow earth was simply that the Nazis believed it too. Which is really only because they both read Helena Blavatsky, who makes the claim in The Secret Doctrine. Also, Hitler believes that the Atlanteans possessed psychic powers, and that they were destroyed by a flood, just like Ike believes. It is this desire of Ike's to get back to the Atlantis evolution that is at the core of his teachings today. To demonstrate this, listen to Ike in this recent lecture read a message given to him by a spirit in 1990. We find in another place that Ike identified this spirit as Magnu, who he said was from Atlantis. Listen to Ike explain first that Atlantis was destroyed and how the ultimate objective is to attain the powers we once had in Atlantis. And in 1990 I experienced this and it stood the test of time in my experience. My own allegiance with your planet goes back to an Atlantean period when there were many energies being used and information and knowledge being used which were, for particular reasons of safety, withdrawn, shall we say, to prevent complete catastrophe, to prevent total destruction of your planet. As the energies around your planet quicken, this is 1990, so these latent energies, these energies which have been withdrawn, will now be phased back in. They will gradually be awakened. As the consciousness level of your planet raises itself, those of you who are working together to raise your consciousness, you will be able to hold more and more refined vibrations, and the energies themselves contain the knowledge and the information which is beginning to service again in your consciousness. So many of you will remember the Atlantean times. You will remember that you communicated with, say, dolphins and whales. You understood these sentient creatures. You could levitate. 
You could manifest things. You could cause spontaneous combustion by not miraculous means at all. Once you know what you're doing, these things follow. It is a matter of order. Now I'm looking at a time on your planet when these energies, this knowledge is reawakened and reintegrated into your consciousness. At the very least, we should all be warned that this philosophy has had negative consequences at least once before in history, because it's the same thing that Hitler wanted. The fifth root race of Blavatsky, which Hitler was trying to bring about, was known as the race of hope, and it was said that they would soon rise to the pinnacle of spirituality formerly attained by Atlantis, but that certain people were holding them back. And as we will see in the final section, Ike also holds to this very dark idea. This idea has always been planned to be used in the context of a one-world government. 33rd degree Freemason Manly P. Hall said, The new Atlantis sets forth an ideal government of the earth. It foretells that day when in the midst of men there shall rise up a vast institution composed of the philosophic elect, an order of illumined men banded together for the purpose of investigating the laws of life and the mysteries of the universe. The age of boundaries is closing, and we are approaching a nobler era when nations shall be no more, when the lines of race and caste shall be wiped out, when the whole earth shall be under one order, one government, one administrative body. Another similarity is the contact with the so-called spiritual hierarchy. As we have seen, Ike is in contact with a plethora of spiritual entities, even up to this very day. The Thule Society, the secret society that Hitler belonged to, also used the theosophical swastika, by the way, believed that highly intelligent spiritual beings existed and that the truly initiated could keep in contact with those beings for information about the world. The occultist Dietrich Eckhart taught Hitler to get in contact with this spiritual hierarchy, and Hitler, in fact, believed he was in contact with this superior mythical race taught about by the Thule Society. Eckhart remarked on his deathbed, quote, Follow Hitler. He will dance, but I am the one to blow the pipe. We have given him the means to put himself in communication with them. The T is capitalized. Mourn me not. I have influenced history more than any other German. Hitler wanted to enhance his connection to these beings further, and Ernest Pretzky, a book dealer, introduced Hitler to a psychedelic drug containing mescaline and peyote. This produced clairvoyant visions that made Hitler believe he had opened the door to more supernatural powers. Ike, too, was seeking a deeper connection to the spirits that had contacted him, and so he went to Brazil, where he took a potent drug used by shamans to contact the spirit world. Ike calls what contacted him that night the voice, and he says that it was the most defining moment of his career. Then came the third stage, which started in 2003, when I had an ayahuasca experience in um, Brazil, and a voice talked to me for five hours about the nature of reality. Real clear, very funny, and uh, mind-blowing and uh, life-changing. I have often wondered if Ike has ever taken any precautions to make sure that the entities that he is in contact with are good entities. He often talks about how the Illuminati are in contact with bad extra-dimensional beings, after all. And the same gods, demonic entities as they're called in this case, that are worshipped by the Satanists, are the same gods that are worshipped by the secret societies and the religions, unknowingly. In Satanism, it's knowingly. These reptilian entities seem to operate, and again, it's not just reptilian. There are, there are many different kinds of entities that do not have a human form that operate just outside of human sight, and history has recorded them as demons and all this stuff. So I wonder if he had a system to discern whether the ones that he's talking to are the same ones that are influencing the Illuminati. You can imagine I was a bit discouraged to hear things like this. Well, I've been on a, a long journey of nearly 20 years now, consciously doing this, and some force has been um, pushing me in different directions through intuition, through urges. I've just got to do this. I've just got to go there. As I've gone through this and followed it, um, and who the force is and they are, I don't know. I, I, I'm not really that interested, funnily enough, because I just go with it and I'll remember what it's all about when I leave this genetic spacesuit. 
Now, here is the mystery, considering all that we have learned so far. I think, I think, I think there's a lot of this uh, whole New Age area, you know, of, um, of ascended masters and all the Blavatsky stuff and uh, Ashtar Command. I say that they are, that is a belief system controlled by the same force, which is also trawling that bloody energy as we go along. Again, considering everything we have just learned, this is clearly an admission that he has been lied to by the spirits all of his life. I mean, if they told him that they were Alice Bailey's ascended masters, which they did, and they taught him theosophy word for word, which they did, he must be admitting here that all that he was taught is a lie. But the problem is, is that he has never stopped teaching and promoting the beings he talked to or what they told him to teach. He clearly attributes everything he is to them. Among these messages that was given to me in 1990 were, uh, he will say things and wonder where they came from. They will be our words. Sometimes we will put knowledge into his mind. Sometimes he will be led to knowledge. And another one was, a little bit later, um, arduous seeking is not necessary. I have given this a lot of thought, and I've come to some possible conclusions. Here are the facts. Ike never has mentioned the name Alice Bailey in his early books, although in them it's clear that he's teaching her doctrine, things like about the seven rays and the coming evolution, the solar logos, the new age, Atlantis, Lemuria, the age of Aquarius, being destroyed because of bad evolution, the earth spirit, the moon problem her particular brand of reincarnation, even wearing certain colors. He never once, though, attributes any of it to her. He attributes it all to the spirits that he channeled. He says he got all this information from the spirit world, which I'm willing to believe, and therefore I suppose it's possible that he hasn't made the connection that everything he believes is from Alice Bailey himself yet. He may have never noticed that what the spirits told him was word for word Alice Bailey and or theosophy. The other possibility is that because he has alluded to, in the past, the idea that sometimes, during channelings, the paradigm of the channeler gets in the way of the message, and so therefore, the message can be tainted by the messenger. He refers to this, I think, to try to explain the fact that he has pages and pages of material of his conversations with Jesus, whom he nowadays says never existed. The idea is that, well, the channeler believed in Jesus, so the name was messed up. But, as we will see later, these beings do much, much more than claim to be some entity. They play the role to the very end and really expect you to go tell people what they told you. There are many problems with this, but the biggest one is that, let's say some of the psychics that he talked to were big Alice Bailey fans, and so he got information that was filtered through their paradigm. Now, that's still not an excuse because we're right back to the problem of, well, if he learned later on that Alice Bailey and her ascended masters lead to a new world order ideology, why is he still teaching us the exact same ideology, only packaged in a way that seems to try to hide the obvious source? We will come back to the investigation of Ike's extra-dimensional entities to see if we can determine anything more about them later on. But for now, let's move on to some of Ike's more earthly sources of his information to see if we can determine anything about the evolution from his early material to his current material, like reptilians. The single most influential person in the development of Ike's current ideas is a man named Brian Desbro. Desbro wrote a lot of conspiracy articles and posted them on the internet in the mid-90s into the 2000s. Later, these articles would be compiled into a book. Desbro is behind an astonishing amount of Ike's research. There's a lot of interesting things about Mr. Desbro. First of all, despite the fact that his bio says that he served as a director of research and development for several American high technology companies and has provided consultation to a company involved in deep space research, there's no record of him doing anything like this on the Internet. Which seems odd, since you would think that if a person who was publishing material on the Internet so early in its history, that he would also leave some trail to his apparently earth-changing scientific research. Another interesting thing is that, despite the fact that Ike, when referring to Desbro, calls him his American scientist friend, you can read Desbro's own bio to find out that his information was given to him by spiritual beings, like Ike. Desbro says, 
During an out-of-body experience, which occurred in 1971, he encountered five highly spiritually evolved, non-physical beings who informed him that he must write a revisionist history of the world. The purpose of the book was to take the readers out of their comfort zones by presenting them with truth regarding such diverse subjects like the true location of Atlantis, the duplicitous acts of the Illuminati, and the fundamentals of free energy technology. It was not until later that the author learned that the non-physical entities that he had encountered were associated with a non-physical directorate who were the overlords of a group of terrestrial mystics known through the centuries as the Coagigon. It is the role of the Coagigon to intercede in the political affairs of the world periodically in an attempt to elevate the level of human spirituality. It's interesting that, like David, Desbro also speaks out very harshly against Alice Bailey and the Ascended Masters in his book. He even says, The Lucius Trust is a major New Age command center on behalf of the Illuminati. And her book, Education in the New Age, outlined a social engineering program which later was adopted by the Club of Rome. In it, she wrote, The science of eugenics will grow. Desborough also writes, Ascended Masters were, in actuality, merely nicknames she had assigned to the wealthy Masonic patrons of the Theosophical Society, and displayed outrage against phony psychics claiming to channel these non-existent beings. But, in an equally amazing feat of doublethink, Desborough believes the exact thing that Alice Bailey believes— that is, that the non-physical directorate, or ascended spiritual beings, are intervening in the political affairs of the world in an attempt to elevate the level of human spirituality, which is arguably the main point to theosophy, as well as all the stuff about the Aryans, which we will see later. As far as Desborough's scientific background, according to his bio, it seems to be limited to a story he tells where a chance encounter with a pediatrician who had been one of Wilhelm Reich's research associates gave him access to all of his notes, which he says enabled him to acquire a knowledge of weather engineering and organotic science. In addition, as luck would have it, a similar thing happened to him, but this time it was with Nikola Tesla's notes. He says he met an old lady at a spiritual healing circle who had asked him if he liked Nikola Tesla. She apparently then told him a story that he writes on his website. It says, quote, One day, continued the lady, Tesla felt a tug on his coat sleeve. Looking down, he saw the landlord's 12-year-old son who said, Mr. Tesla, will you teach me all that you know? Tesla was so impressed that the boy became one of Tesla's enthusiastic protégés and later married the lady the author had just met. The lady then provided the author with some of her late husband's research notes on free energy and anti-gravitic technology. In this manner, many doors were opened, thus enabling the author to acquire meaningful data for his two books. The strangest part about Desborough's bio, in my opinion, is that he claims to be an expert at deprogramming mind control victims. He claims that he does this in order to get information out of them to help his research into the New World Order. He has written quite a lot about trauma-based mind control, and at that time, very little was known on the internet about it, and it does appear he knows quite a lot about how to program multiples. This will become very interesting as we continue this investigation. So with all that in mind, let's take a look at how David Icke was influenced by Brian Desbro. Icke's book, The Biggest Secret, is the first time that I know of that Icke mentions Desbro in print. He dedicated that particular book to him, and he cites him profusely throughout the book as his source for things like Martians coming to Earth and founding the Aryan race, which the reptilians used to overtake the planet. Brian is also the source for much of the information on the Babylonian world, and things like black people are a result of the Earth being closer to the sun at one point, the Ice Age being an illusion, monoatomic gold, directed energy weapons, UFOs are government craft, crop circles are space beams, David's new view on Jesus, and much more. Ivan Fraser, the other person who David dedicated his book, The Biggest Secret to, later spoke out against David and said this about Brian Desbro. Quote, Is there anything David could tell us about Brian Desbro's background to allay any doubts we may have about his integrity, considering his massive influence in the content and direction of The Biggest Secret? Also, Ike's subsequent book called Alice in Wonderland and the World Trade Center Disaster is no better than a copy and pasting of Brian Desborough's article entitled The 9-11 Disaster, The Myth and Reality. If you have read Ike's Alice in Wonderland book on 9-11, please read Desborough's article when you have time. 
and you will see that the information in there is exactly the same the wording, even the mistakes. But the curious thing is that even though it's clear from reading Desborough's 9-11 article that Desborough is the one who did all the research, Ike doesn't cite Desborough one time in his book, even though it's painfully obvious that it was taken from him. I think that Desborough was quite content to feed information to Ike, even if he got no credit. One example of this is in regard to the reptilian scandal. As I mentioned, the biggest secret is dedicated to Brian Desborough and another man named Ivan Frazier. According to Frazier, it was Desbro that introduced Ike to Arizona Wilder, and it was her testimony that ended up being the reason why Ike went public with the reptilians thing. Desbro also admits to introducing Ike to Arizona Wilder, as well as arranging the meeting between the two, because Wilder was a victim of trauma-based mind control, and apparently Desbro had accessed her programming in order to get information about the Illuminati. According to him, he was amazed to find that she confirmed what he had already been telling Ike, which will be important later. This is Ivan Fraser's side of the story. He had been proofreading The Biggest Secret for David Ike, and he found out about the reptilians thing this way. He says, quote, Arizona Wilder was not mentioned at all in the draft copy of The Biggest Secret, which I had read. David had not met her yet. When the book was released, people started ringing me with questions like, is it true about the reptiles? And is this stuff about the royal family true? At which time I replied that I thought it was, based on the fact that the version that I had read stated only the theory of reptilians and that certain of the royals were involved in satanic rituals. Soon I heard about Arizona Wilder. David stated that he saw his encounter with Arizona Wilder as an amazing synchronicity which endorsed his work in his latest book. How could she have known all this stuff which tallied so exactly with the biggest secret? Well, I believe I'm not as naive as David, and I know exactly how she could have known. Ike was passing copies of the book via post to me and others for editing. Fraser continues, This brings in another character who is pivotal to the entire Biggest Secret thesis. It was a contact of David's named Brian Desbro who introduced Arizona to David. Brian is mentioned as a source for a great deal of the information in the book, having supplied most of the material on which David based his idea about the Martians coming to Earth and founding the Aryan race, which the reptilians use as a vehicle to overtake the planet. Brian is also the source for much of the information David had compiled on the Babylonian world, its myths, and how they fed into the sinister secret societies. It was Brian Desbro who was also looking at the draft copy of The Biggest Secret at the same time as myself, i.e. before David met Arizona Wilder. Therefore, the fact that Brian Desbro may be responsible for fundamentally leading the direction of David's research, if not planting much of the basis of the book in David's mind, is obvious. But then, to be the same person responsible for giving him the so-called eyewitness to testify to the verity of that information is highly suspicious. Brian also writes articles on mind control and seems very knowledgeable on the subject. Is it possible that he could be directly involved in some way that we are not being told about? Frazier also says that Arizona endorsed Desborough's theories so closely that, quote, you would almost think she had already read the book or had been given the information beforehand. He continues... Or, considering that she claims to be an ex-mind-controlled slave, could it be that she was pre-programmed? Testimony from Mark Phillips and Kathy O'Brien as to how arduous it is to deprogram a CIA slave makes me very suspicious that Arizona Wilder could be considered reliable. She claims that since her programmer died, the programming broke down. I don't believe this can be accepted as such. And external experts would have to be brought in to convince me that if she was controlled to the highest level, that she could be so deprogrammed now to be considered reliable. Brian Desbro describes the story in this way. My own research, based on unpublished astrophysical data, revealed that Mars originally occupied our planet's orbit and was populated by a technologically advanced Aryan race. A celestial catastrophe displaced Mars into its present orbit, forcing the Aryan survivors to colonize our planet and subsequently construct the Great Pyramid. Then they were overthrown by an evil priesthood who established the royal court of the dragon in Egypt. While David was writing his book, it was my good fortune to meet the mother goddess of the Illuminati. She corroborated my research, adding that the Illuminati hierarchy are shape-shifting dragons who require the consumption of Aryan blood in order to maintain their shape-shifting capability, hence their opposition to interracial marriages. As we watch these clips of Arizona Wilder, notice that when she was asked about the history of the reptilians, that she says that she was made to learn this. No matter who she thinks taught her this information, the fact that a bunch of Satanists made someone learn something sounds like programming to me. 
your experience um, uh, being brought up in this uh, Illuminati um, environment, um, were you ever told anything about where these reptilians came from and, and, and what is the history of it all? Uh, I was made to learn through Mothers of Darkness, which is a certain aspect of the organization, because that was an early, early part of my training, uh, the history of what was the Illuminati on, on this planet. And what I learned was that the Aryans originally were from Mars, and they came, they were the, the reptilians came to that planet to, uh, they came from another place, they came to that planet. They came to rule because they, and, and they wanted to mix, so they said, with that race. And, um, but they became the overlords. That's an interesting term, overlords. Brian Desbro uses it almost 30 times in his book, compared to Ike using it one time, and even that was in a quote. It doesn't prove that the info was planted by Desbro, but it is a suspicious coincidence. And the Martians, or Aryans, were seeking to escape from it. They went to the moon, and then were there attacked, and they then went to Earth and established culture here on Earth approximately 6,000 years ago. And at that point in time, uh, they, were all, they were doing well and they were mixing with indigenous, the indigenous population of this Earth they were getting along with. And then about 4,000 years ago, the Aryan, or the uh, reptilians, arrived here and again began to take over uh, and they, in, they instilled themselves in different places uh, underground in, in the uh, earth and also this one part of them, the ruling part, took over and became involved in the politics and in the religion um, and started controlling through these means at that point in time. A woman named Sva Lee, who is widely regarded as trustworthy by many in the truth movement of all backgrounds, claims to be a former programmer for the Illuminati. She is currently in hiding, we hope, but her writings, which are still posted on the internet, fill in many of the details about how mind control slaves are programmed. One time she was asked about this reptilian idea. The question is, Sva Lee, I have to ask you this. There are stories floating around on the internet about the Illuminati and other agencies being run by extraterrestrials, in particular a reptilian race operating from a higher dimension. Any thoughts on that? My answer will probably cause a lot of anger, and it's not meant to step on any toes. Here it goes. I have never seen an alien or extraterrestrial. I have seen some programming to make people think they saw aliens as a cover story for programming, if they remembered. None of the head trainers I knew or others on the leadership council believed in aliens, although I never asked them. I personally believe that the reptilian stuff is actually the demonic at work. I have seen shape-shifting and other stuff because of demonic influence. Okay, so some of you here will say, gee, she believes in demons, that's as far out as aliens. Well, this is what the Illuminati certainly believe in. They know there are spiritual realities and they think that they can control them. Those of a more cynical bent would say that the shape-shifting was a drug-induced hallucination and group hysteria in the context of a ritual setting. I will let each reader decide based on their personal comfort zone, but no, absolutely no reptiles or aliens seen in Washington, D.C. or San Diego, California as of five years ago. At least I never saw them. Interesting that Ike seems to validate this idea that spirits can make a person shape-shift. It was a, a lady who um, channeled this... Uh consciousness back in 1990 and um, I'll just read what it said because it's so relevant to now um, with the hindsight of the years that have passed and if anyone doesn't you know believe in shape-shifting they should have seen this woman's face when she was doing this because she became someone else her face it was like whoa um, changed to a completely different uh, face 
I would say that Arizona Wilder's testimony is worth listening to. It seems to be consistent with high-level satanic rituals. I would suggest one possibility is that she may have been made to learn the reptilian story, as Spally suggested, so that if her programming did ever begin to break down, she would tell people that it was reptilians instead of satanic rituals. Something that a lot of people miss about her testimony is that the entire purpose for the ritual she did was to summon what she calls demons, or old ones, so that they could give more information about how the New World Order should be set up to the top-level people. It's clear that she believes it's the demons, not reptilians, that are behind the planning for the New World Order. They materialize from out of another dimension and are present at rituals, and they are so powerful and um, their their presence is is an, such an evilness about them, and they want out of this other dimension, and they can't they they have to be called out by someone who has that power, and the reptilians don't have this power. That's that's very important that they don't have this power. So these during ritual, these old ones are called out. Um, and they are what Christianity would have called the demons and they want out they're always demanding to be let out and so you have to be very powerful to keep them in line and to make them go back when it is time for them to go back why do the reptilians want to manifest these, these quote, demons um, at the rituals? It brings power to the rituals. It brings power to them. It, they are told things by these entities, and they are encouraged uh, to go on with what they're doing, and knowledge is imparted to them through these entities. If this is the case, why is there no attempt to see what we can learn about them? Why all this focus on reptilians and Mars and Aryans? By her own admission, they aren't calling the shots. The spirits behind them are. I want to mention a few more things about the reptilian issue before moving on. She states that the reptilians change back to reptilians when asleep. Considering how many of them were educated in schools, where they also lived amongst hundreds of others in dorms, and many of them are in the armed forces, you would think that someone would have noticed this happening by now. Hey buddy, you don't look so good when you fall asleep. She states that the royal reptilians can't stay in human form at the scent of blood, and transform and go crazy ripping into their victims. And in all those years, nobody has ever noticed this when they cut themselves, been around blood, menstruating women, etc.? Considering they are so public, there is no way that they have never been in the vicinity of blood. The other testimony that Ike uses to confirm the reptilian issue is that of Credo Mutua. This is what Ivan Fraser said about Mutua. Quote, Soon after this, the Arizona Wilder interview, David re-emerged from a trip to Africa, announcing a new video called The Reptilian Agenda, which is an interview with a Zulu shaman called Credo Mutua, who is confirming the evidence of shape-shifting reptilians. Crater recounts various ancient Zulu myths about the reptilian race which manipulates mankind, which are taken literally by himself and Ike, and seen as a remarkable confirmation of the reptile-human race theory. Although Crater's version is that the race actually originated on Earth, left it, and returned. Furthermore, the central reptile-Aryan race thesis is fundamentally challenged by Mutois' assertion that the black leaders of his country and their bloodlines are from the reptilian race also. Mutua also speaks about personal encounters with gray aliens, which he states are servants of the reptilians. Mutua elsewhere, rather contradictorily, states that the grays are actually the reptilians with an artificial skin. This contradiction is not challenged by Ike. I also agree with Fraser when he says that both Mutua and Arizona Wilder may be consciously very genuine in recounting their experiences according to their memories, but I believe we need to be extremely careful before buying in to what amounts to circumstantial stories with no proof. Also, I want to address this idea that's circulating on YouTube and other video sites, that people's pupils change and you can tell that they're reptilians this way. This is an effect caused by uploading a video with bad resolution. The same effect is happening with other elements in the picture. But you only notice it on the eyes because the eyes are very detailed things and when the pixels cut out on them it's more noticeable than it is with the other elements in the picture. Even Ike doesn't believe this stuff. All over the um, 
internet people have started talking about this now and these pictures are circulating. Uh, this might be a, probably is a, a, just a trick of the light, but it's very symbolic of what we're looking at. Uh, Desborough gave Ike another view that became very important to Ike's teaching. He gave him his current view on Jesus. Most of you might not know, but Ike's view about Jesus changes dramatically from book to book. For instance, the early Ike is very confident that Jesus existed, only that the Bible didn't include parts of his story that it should have. There is a thin line of truth in the Bible, certainly. And many of the things that the being Jesus, who certainly did exist, and certainly did die in that way, um, says are accurate reflections of what he said, but they are taken out of context and misinterpreted. One interesting way to demonstrate that his views change dramatically about this from book to book is by first quoting this passage from Truth Vibrations. He says, quote, My own feeling and what I have channeled and seen leads me to believe that Jesus survived the crucifixion. I had a very strong vision of Jesus on the cross. During that vision, I was with Jesus, experiencing what he felt. He experienced great pain in his hands and wrists, and he was utterly exhausted. I then saw a pole being raised with a cloth, which was offered to his mouth. From this he took a drink. Soon after this he appeared to lose consciousness. When he awoke, he was lying with people all around him, attending to his wounds. They were all in white, I remember. It was clear that Jesus was in a state of shock. He whispered, I live, I live as though he had expected to leave the physical body. I had other visions and channeling, which together gave me this overall picture of what actually happened 2,000 years ago. Now listen to his version of the crucifixion in his next book, Love Changes Everything. When the channeling, crucifixion, had finished, one of the followers asked if Jesus could be taken down, and his request was granted. He was still alive at this point, but the swift movement of the sword removed him from the physical level. Only Jesus knew for certain he would die. So, in this version, Jesus did die, which is obviously a massive contradiction from the previous book with no explanation of the discrepancy. Keep in mind, in that book, Jesus personally talks to David on a regular basis. For instance, Jesus is quoted as saying things like, quote, I was so determined, David, so determined to ensure that the truth could not disappear because one man was nailed to some wood, and I knew the effect it would have on Lucifer Satan if the energies were powerful enough. Ike always tries to downplay his famous claim to be the Son of God. He always said he was simply claiming to be a Son of God, not the Son of God. But the problem is, is that he really did claim that he personally was the one spoken of in the Bible that was going to return. He claims in this clip to be the second coming of Christ. If you think if Jesus were alive today and you'd been alive then, he would be doing writing books and doing promo tours and appearing on television programs and so forth. Would he be promoting it in the same way Absolutely. that you are now? Tell you the funny thing, Nicky, you know. Um, the Bible actually predicts the coming of the Son of Man, the coming of the Son of God, um, at this time of great change. Oh, n right now? Yeah. Well, yeah, so, at this time so of great change. The Bible predicts you, in a way. Yeah, exactly. It, ca it, ca it calls the being the Son of Man. Where is that? So people. That is in the, the book of Revelations towards the end. Right. And it's also earlier on in, in some of the Gospels, too. Um, what do they expect this Son of Man to look like? Do they expect him to wear a beard and a white robe? Well, they don't expect him to be a Hereford United goalkeeper. Correct. But did they expect, the, the, the people 2,000 years ago didn't expect their son of God or whatever to be a carpenter's son, and he got the same reaction. You see, what it is, it's about incarnating into a body uh, that relates to the world as it is at the time. That's why Jesus was a carpenter's son and worked in, in, in Palestine. Why, why in this life have I... Because you're I, a broadcaster. Exactly. Why was I taken were, into the communications? You were taught self-discipline in sport. Correct. Mm, and all that. This is how it's done. Yeah. And um, so I'm comfortable talking to you, and I'm comfortable on television, I'm comfortable in broadcasting, which, which, which is a great help to get over the truth, as the world is at the moment where the media is the vehicle to do it. Um, you are given the gifts, and we're all given the gifts, uh, that, that, that uh, we need in particular lifetimes and at this time in this lifetime i need certain abilities to um be comfortable uh, on the media and know the media and and that's what's been given to me and as most of you know ike's view on jesus changes dramatically from here he would later add elements from various books that he read and by the time he gets to the biggest secret he exchanged all previous views for brian desborough's view have you ever heard of Ike talk about Tammuz and Nimrod and Queen Semiramis? 
I'm pretty sure you have. It's one of the most common parts of Ike's presentations, and he rarely misses an opportunity to launch into his spiel. Um, in Babylon, they had a trinity of Queen Samirimus, also known as Ishtar or Istar, Nimrod, the sun god, she was the moon goddess, and Tammuz, who was the virgin-born son of Nimrod and Samirimus. He took this view word for word from Brian Desbro, and although he doesn't credit Desbro for it, it's clear that he did. For instance, there is no mention of Tammuz or Samirimus before this book, and it's obvious that he is using the same wording from Desbro's article called The Great Pyramid Mystery, Tomb, Occult Initiation Center, or what? For instance, Ike writes, Tammuz, who is said to have been crucified with a lamb at his feet and placed in a cave when a rock was rolled away from the cave's entrance three days later. Now compare that with what Desbro writes, Tammuz, who, according to the writer Langton Tias, was said to have been crucified with a lamb at his feet and placed in a cave when a rock was rolled away from the cave's entrance three days later. The only difference is that Ike takes out the reference to Langton Tias. One reason he probably did this is because Langton Tias was a person who was widely known for taking Christianity and trying to explain it using pagan symbology to be more acceptable to the pagans. So it's not shocking if we were to find this information, but as we will see, even given this, the claim is still not true, and that's probably why Ike drops the reference altogether. In any case, the point is that Ike took the reference, and it's clear that Ike had access to this particular article, because in other places in his book, The Biggest Secret, when Ike cites Desbro, he cites this very same article. The footnote reads, Brian Desbro, The Great Pyramid Mystery, Tomb, A Cold Initiation Center, or What? A document supplied to the author, and also published in the California Sun newspaper, Los Angeles. The biggest problem here is not who he got the information from, but how terrible the information is. No scholar would ever write that a rock was rolled away from Tammuz's tomb after three days. This is a flat-out untruth with no apologies. Even Acharya S., who Desbro is misquoting right here, disagrees with this idea. And that's saying something if you know who she is. Ike traded in his earlier view of Jesus for this most easily disproved one. I will call it the zeitgeist version of Jesus. This is the one where he did not exist in history, but was an amalgamation of ancient pagan gods. This is the one that I believed for a long time, thanks to David Icke. But I started doing some investigation on my own, and I realized that something was really wrong with this view. Although it sounded plausible and even scientific, I couldn't confirm any of it with the actual writings about these gods from the original sources. And all the people that claimed that these things could be found in the original sources were Freemasons or Luciferians. For instance, Icke tells us in The Biggest Secret that Horus was the Good Shepherd that Horus was the lamb. Horus was baptized at age 30. He was the child of a virgin. His birth was marked by a star. He had 12 followers. Horus was the morning star. Horus was the cursed. Horus was tempted on a mountain by Set, and that he was a child teacher in a temple. The problem is, is that none of this is true. If you read every single thing you can find that the Egyptians wrote about Horus, you won't find any of this stuff. It's a flat out lie. And guess who Ike cites for his claims like this? Albert Churchward, a high-level Freemason. And not only that, but someone who lacks any expertise in this field. I think one reviewer of his book on Amazon said it best about Albert Churchward in regard to his scholarship, quote, This book is not recommended for those expecting a scientific approach. The absence of any description of the author's academic background explains it all. I've had a website up called zeitgeistchallenge.com since the film Zeitgeist came out. And it offers $1,000 cash to anyone who can simply show where in the ancient texts these things can be found. I've yet to have one serious submission to this challenge since the website was put up. I have had a lot of people confident that they could answer the challenge until they started to look for the actual writings themselves, which is why I put the site up in the first place, to get people to come to the same conclusions that I did on my own. This is a Freemasonic lie. Yes, I know that the movie gives a long list of their sources, but if you inspect those sources, you will find that they do not even attempt to cite actual original texts, but instead cite recent authors who themselves do not cite sources. If this idea that I'm suggesting makes you mad and you think that I'm kidding, please watch the films Zeitgeist Refuted, Final Cut, or Zeitgeist Part 1 Exposed, the film. In the footnotes, you'll find both of them, and they're both by two separate filmmakers and they do a great job of showing how easily this idea is refuted. In fact, of all the various versions of Jesus that Ike has had, this current view is the most easily refuted. 
Now let's go back to Desbro and Ike's view about all the Babylonian symbolism in Christianity. But first, let me explain something that will really help you understand what we're about to discuss. Christianity was around for at least 300 years before the Vatican existed. Secular history records a massive slaughter that literally lasted the entire early history of Christianity. Almost every emperor of Rome, starting with Nero, continued the relentless genocide of Christians. They fed them to the lions in arenas, and they burnt them alive for fun. This is what being a Christian was for the first 300 years of their history. Deciding to be a Christian was basically deciding to be tortured and killed publicly. It wasn't a decision that people made lightly. These people's beliefs were nothing like the Babylonian religion of Rome. This is one reason why Rome hated them so much. A good example of this is the Emperor Diocletian, who believed he had eliminated all the Christians. He erected monuments to himself that boasted of this supposed accomplishment. It was engraved, Diocletian, Jovian, Maximin, Herculeus, Caesarus, Augusti, for having everywhere abolished the superstition of Christ, for having extended the worship of the gods. It was only after one of the emperors, Constantine, was said to convert to Christianity, and the jury is still out as to whether that actually happened or not, but one thing is certain, after that time the government decided to stop fighting Christianity, and instead it seeked to totally control it. It unwisely declared Christianity the official religion of Rome, which, as you can imagine, was a shock to all the pagan citizens of Rome. This is when you start to see all the pagan symbolism start to creep into Christianity. It was added, at least in part, to appease the pagans and incorporate their symbolism into a religion that they had all tried to destroy for the last 300 years. And this is the key to understanding this. The Bible itself, the writings that the Christians were reading during their times of persecution, doesn't support any of these Illuminati symbols or ideas. This is why the Vatican made reading the Bible illegal in the 1200s. The real Christians were literally burned alive with their illegal copies of the Bible chained around their necks. Even to this day, the Catholics do not recommend reading the Bible themselves. They say it's better left to the priests to interpret for them. This is also why it was not allowed to be translated into any language but Latin for a thousand years. The obvious reason is that if the people were allowed to read the Bible, they would know that the empire was telling them to do and believe things that were not in the Bible. Take the second commandment, for instance. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. Now this should help you see what's going on when David shows this picture of Mary and the Queen of Heaven. Yeah, sure there's an ancient goddess called the Queen of Heaven, and the Roman Catholics do call Mary the Queen of Heaven. But has anyone ever read to you what the Bible says about this Queen of Heaven? In the book of Judges, 1 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, and Jeremiah, it talks about this pagan sacrifice and mentions specifically the pagan goddess called the Queen of Heaven several times. And God declares because of their worship of this pagan goddess called the Queen of Heaven that he would withdraw his protection from them and judge them. The fact that the Roman government took the story of Mary and inserted their favorite goddess, the same one that the Bible actually warns us about, does not mean that Christianity was based on the Queen of Heaven. It just means that the government was tricking people into doing what they wanted them to do. And as generations went by, with people no longer reading the Bible anymore, it got easier and easier to trick people in regard to what was and what wasn't actually in the Bible. So this is why there is the Babylonian depiction of Semiramis and Tammuz, and this is a Christian church. Same again. Um, this is a picture I took last Christmas in uh, Rome when I was there for a television program. And uh, that appears to be um, Jesus and Mary. Actually, it's Samirimus and Tamil. I don't even think that I understood this one when I did believe that Ike was genuine. Has anyone ever stopped to consider that mothers with children might be the most common motif in art in the history of the world? I mean, mothers have always had children since the dawn of time, right? Even before there were fruit bowls to paint, there were no shortage of mothers with children. I think it's kind of funny when I hear people showing a picture of a mother and a child statue, as if they're making a deep connection to Christianity. If statues of mothers with children is a specific thing, 
only to be compared with Mary and Jesus, that I have a lot more similarities with Mary and Jesus that I would like to add to the list, from every culture and every time period. Again, you won't find any descriptions of Mary holding Jesus at all in the Bible. It's not some special idea in the Bible at all. This is art commissioned by the Roman government, and it has nothing to do with Christianity. Early Christians did not make images of Jesus because of what they thought was obedience to the second commandment about making idols. This artwork is only something you see after Rome starts calling the shots and telling everyone this is what Christianity is now. And the sad thing is, nowadays we believe them. This also explains this idea of halos. So much is made about these halos in theosophy and in the occult, but there is nothing about halos in the Bible. Early Christians wouldn't even make paintings of Jesus in the first place, as we mentioned. The halos on Jesus or other people that Rome made the artist paint is only evidence that as pagans, the Roman slash Babylonians were trying to appeal to the pagans who were used to seeing their gods like this. The whole idea is foreign to real Christianity and foreign to the Bible. Just another case of Ike telling you to believe that the Illuminati version of Christianity is the real version. But my favorite one that Ike uses is this one. This is another depiction of Nimrod in the ancient world. He was also the fish god. Again, Jesus, the fish. Um, and um, he had the fish head hat. This is a, a, a depiction, an actual depiction from Babylon. And that's why we have the mitre in the Pope. The key to this one is the connection that Ike makes to Jesus and fish. Did you catch it? Again, Jesus, the fish. Jesus is in no way associated with fish, except in the occult world, where Blavatsky stated this because she wanted to connect Jesus to the age of Pisces, so that she could be done with him in her new age. When Jordan Maxwell does this, he always will say, Jesus the Fisher King, which is not a title for Jesus at all. Jesus wasn't a Fisher King or a fisherman. Jesus was a carpenter. This is a little mind trick that Maxwell plays to build up the case that Jesus was associated with Pisces. There are about three things that people say to equate Jesus with fish so they can either make this Dagon hat connection or the Pisces connection. Let's look at them really quick so we can see why Ike's quote Jesus the fish thing is so wrong. A few of Jesus' disciples were fishermen. Now does that make Jesus a fish? He did feed many people one time with two fish. And this is why people equate him with the astrological sign of Pisces, which is represented by two fish. But when people make this claim, they never mention that only a few days later, he did the same thing with more than two fish and a different number of loaves. Why wouldn't they tell you about that instance a few pages later? Because it ruins the whole Pisces thing. The fact is that Jesus did all kinds of miracles. We don't associate Jesus with ears, even though he was said to heal a man's ear once. And the final thing that people do is point to the Jesus fish on cars. This symbol was representative of an acrostic in the Greek language that early Christians used to use as a sign to see if certain places were safe for them during the persecutions. It meant Jesus anointed God, Son, and Savior, and it doesn't make Jesus a fish. Before moving on to another man who Ike bases his beliefs on, I will conclude that the reason that the emperors of Rome and later the Roman Catholic Church tried to keep the Bible from people is that contrary to what we are taught in the so-called truth movement, the Bible is incredibly anti-Illuminati. Not only does God reveal to people like Ezekiel that the elites of his day, the Illuminati if you will, were worshipping the sun behind closed doors, and later he showed him that the secret worship of Tammuz was going on too. It is filled with discussions and promises to judge this so-called secret power of lawlessness, which we might call the Illuminati. See my video, Was the Bible Written or Changed by the Illuminati, for more on this. Another of Ike's sources is a man named Michael Talbot. He wrote the book, The Holographic Universe, and Ike quotes him frequently as the basis for his belief that nothing is real and everything is a hologram. Talbot spends the first few chapters of his book doing an excellent job of describing a well-known theory of Carl Pribram and David Boehm called the holonomic brain theory. In their experiment, they cut out different parts of rats' brains and ran them through mazes and discovered that memories were apparently stored in each sector of the brain, which is similar to a hologram in that each piece of the hologram contains some information about the entire image. 
both Bohm and Pribram would later speculate about applying what they found in the brain to the entire universe, but it would remain just a theory. The rest of Talbot's book simply starts naming paranormal phenomenon and declaring that it exists because the universe is a hologram. He rarely if ever cites his evidence, and when he does, he reveals his lack of discernment. Consider his support of Sai Baba. Talbot spends several pages gushing over Baba as a perfect example that the universe is a hologram because Baba, according to Talbot, performs these miracles. But watch this video of Baba performing what can only be described as cheap sleight of hand tricks as I read from the holographic universe. Perhaps the most famous modern day materializations are those produced by Sai Baba, a 64 year old Indian holy man living in a distant corner of the state of Andhra Pradesh in southern India. According to numerous eyewitnesses, Sai Baba is able to produce much more than salt and a few stones. He plucks lockets, rings, and jewelry out of the air and passes them out as gifts. He also materializes an endless supply of Indian delicacies and sweets, and out of his hands pours volumes of vibhuti, or sacred ash. These events have been witnessed by literally thousands of individuals, including both scientists and magicians, and no one has ever detected any hint of trickery. He can make sweet syrups and fragrant oils pour from his hands. He can produce exotic objects, such as grains of rice with tiny, perfectly carved pictures of Krishna on them. Equally astonishing are his productions of sacred ash. Every time he walks among the crowds that visit him, prodigious amounts of it pour from his hands. He scatters it everywhere, into offered containers and outstretched hands, over heads and in long serpentine trails on the ground. If Sai Baba had produced them by sleight of hand, it was undetectable to us. Talbot also talks about cases of stigmata. This is when people get wounds in their hands and feet that are supposed to be similar to those of Christ. These cases are dubious at best, especially because the wounds usually happen when no one is looking. But this doesn't stop Talbot from simply declaring them all to be genuine and evidence that the universe is a hologram. Or take some of the cases that Ike is fond of referring to. I'm sure you've all heard of the hypnotist that made the man see through his daughter. Everyone seems to love that one. Like that the wonderful story told by Michael Talbot in the holographic universe. Yeah. And I read that page over and over again when I first saw that book in the late 1980s. This is the story about the stage hypnotist who hypnotized the father to believe that his, father was invi that his daughter was invisible. Mm -hmm. And then he was able to read an inscription on the watch held behind her, his, her, her body because for him it was no longer there and reality had changed. It was physically different in his mind. Like you write about in your book, um, about the fellow who's um, the hypnotist uh, told the man, your daughter is not in the room with us any longer, and he looked right through the daughter to the man's watch. Um, he tells a story in here, which is so brilliant, that's why I, I do tell it quite often, because it's so symbolic of what, what I'm talking about. He attended a party which his father um, had, and he had a state hypnotist along to do party tricks for the guests. There came a point where he, the hypnotist is dealing with this guy called Tom and he said to him, he's doing through the tricks, and then he said to him, when I bring you back to a waking state, you're not going to be able to see your daughter in the room. At which point the hypnotist led the daughter to stand right in front of the father who's looking in her belly. He brings him out of a waking, uh, uh, to a waking state, or apparently so, and he says, Tom, can you see your daughter? Tom's looking around, no, I can't see her. She's giggling, he can't hear her. The hypnotist went behind the daughter, put his hand in the small of her back and said, I'm holding something, Tom, what am I holding? He looked bemused because it was so obvious to him. He said, you're holding a watch. He says, there's an inscription on the uh, watch, Tom, can you read it? He peered forward, read the inscription. His daughter standing between him and the watch. The problem is, is that Talbot simply says this happened at his own father's friend's house. There's no citation whatsoever. We are asked to simply trust him that this happened. Let me ask you, if this was so easy that all a good hypnotist had to do was to tell someone that their daughter wasn't there, how come it hasn't been reproduced in a lab or some other place where this could be verified with a measure of proof? I mean, was this particular hypnotist the only guy in the world that could do this? Why not have someone simply put the idea to the test and prove it? I hope you see that the answer to that question is obvious. Talbot had preconceived notions himself. He describes how he grew up in a haunted house, and these ghosts would mess with him and his family. 
He describes involuntary out-of-body experiences and a host of other experiences involving what he calls poltergeists. He was on a mission to validate his experiences, even by his own admission. Here are some reviews of his book that I think sum this up well. I was profoundly disappointed by the book. I was expecting something that took an analytical view of an intriguing theory and explored its implications. Instead, what Talbot provided was a general overview of holography, some broad statements about its implications, and then tons of anecdotes about psychic phenomena that he claims are explained by everything being a hologram. Sadly, that's not science, nor is it compelling writing. Another reviewer says, The book is completely disingenuous and uses numerous case studies where the evidence is presented in a dishonest way. A simple Google search will turn up enough information on many of the book's claims to start to raise doubt. Further investigation will make you very upset that the evidence is presented so matter-of-factly, with no mention of the numerous controversies surrounding the evidence. This would be funny if it weren't obvious that Ike has based much of what he believes on this idea of the holographic universe. Now, let's move on to the next chapter where we will explore in depth David Icke's most influential source. They tell him what to write, what to say, what to wear, what to believe and what not to believe, and he calls them the guys. The, the beings which we, we call the guys uh, told us about. You call them the guys? The, gu- the guys, yeah. It's, mm. But the beings like... Uh, uh, Ataro, Rakowski. Rakowski. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. right. I would have, it's highly likely that I'm something to do with the whole process because I'm I would interviewing have, you. Well, yeah. it's, it's difficult because I, I need to check all this out because you've mm. been throwing this at me and I need to sit down and check this out with the guys. But yeah. um, spirits, I, would, yeah. I would have said that you were um, certainly involved in, in a great chance of being involved at that time. David often says that these beings have always guided him. It was the same beings that originally contacted him that are still guiding him. Well, I've been on a, a, a long journey of nearly 20 years now, consciously doing this, and some force has been um, pushing me in different directions. In Love Changes Everything, he says, those who are helping the planet and humanity through this crucial period in their evolution, they have asked me to put together in this book all that I have learned so far. And that, quote, communicating with such beings on other levels of creation is the most natural thing in the world. When he describes how it is that this communication with the guys takes place, he says, quote, this process is called channeling. The thought forms can be turned into written words. This is known as automatic writing. Your hand writes on the paper, sometimes with incredible speed, but the words and information are not yours and could not possibly be yours because you often know nothing about the subjects taking shape in front of you. It is also possible to hear the thought forms as a soft, gentle voice inside your head. I call this method getting it direct. On a more limited level, it is possible to communicate through dowsing. Perhaps Do you actually happen. hear the voices in your head? It depends. Sometimes you hear voices. Sometimes it comes um, in terms of them talking through you. So they, they talk through your voice box. And it also comes through um, what's known as automatic writing. You, you, you get a sheet of paper, you put a pen in your hand, and they just take over your arm. They write. And they write amazing things which you have no comprehension of. I mean, He also still quotes from them from time to time as evidence that he still considers the information accurate. An example is that he closes most of his lectures with a quote from a being named Magnu from his book Love Changes Everything. And he says that his words are really their words. And one that where they came from, they will be our words. These beings, as we saw in the first chapter, dictated the belief system of theosophy to him. And although he does not call it that today, it is clear that that's what it is. Given what we learned in the first section about the connection to Alice Bailey, who also was in contact with entities, how can we be sure that Ike is not listening to the wrong spiritual forces, the ones that seem to be orchestrating the New World Order? He is the first to admit that these beings exist. We can gain some wisdom from a man some of you may know named Terence McKenna. He was a man who encountered several beings from other dimensions, according to his books. He had some sobering words for people like David Ike when he said, It is no great accomplishment to hear a voice in the head. The accomplishment is to make sure it is telling the truth, because the demons are of many kinds. There is no dignity in the universe unless we meet these things on our feet, and that means having an I-thou relationship. One say to the other, you say you're omniscient, omnipresent, or you say you're from Zeta Reticuli. You're long in the talk, but what can you show me? 
Magicians, people who invoke these things, have always understood that one must go into such encounters with one's wits about oneself. You can get a few things from this quote. Number one, McKenna believed that extra-dimensional entities were prone to lying about their identities. And number two, they were able to be summoned in magic rituals. And number three, that they don't necessarily have our best interest in mind, although they always would present it in that way in order to be trusted or to get us to do whatever they wanted us to do. I find it very interesting that McKenna said that the same entities that don't need to be trusted are the same ones that occultists summon in rituals. Although McKenna seemed to know that these entities were deceptive, he still sought contact with them, and he even attributed his amazing ability to speak eloquently to possession by one of them. He says, After the experiment at La Correa, I had apparently evolved into some sort of mouthpiece for the incarnate Logos. I could talk to small groups of people with what appeared to be electrifying effect about peculiarly transcendental matters that you will read about in these pages. It was as though my ordinary, rather humdrum personality had simply been turned off and speaking through me was the voice of another, a voice that was steady, unhesitating, and articulate, a voice seeking to inform others about the power and promise of psychedelic dimensions. From my study of the 2012 phenomenon, I have seen that these entities are very interested in getting people to go out and spread the idea that a spiritual evolution is coming. And like McKenna warned us about, they pretend to be all kinds of things in order to get us to tell their story. For instance, all the main forerunners of the 2012 idea got their revelation about 2012 and spiritual evolution from spiritual entities claiming to be different things. Jose Arguez got his information from a long-dead Mayan priest. Jose actually now changed his name to reflect that he believes himself to be a reincarnation of that Mayan priest. McKenna got his 2012 information from a being he calls the Logos. Pinchback from a being called Quetzalcoatl. David Wilcock from the Egyptian god Ra. Barbara Hanclough from the Pleiadians. I might have even been able to believe that these entities were good and were simply giving the same message under different names just to make the message easy for the person to handle, if it weren't for the fact that all the information they gave about astronomy and science was so wrong. For instance, David Icke in his book, And the Truth Shall Set You Free, talks about the quote, photon belt. Keep in mind while we read this that this information is 100% channeled information originally. None of it is real science, and we will see how wrong this theory is in a moment. He begins, Underpinning these astrological events in this period is the photon belt. Many psychics and esoteric scientists, notice how he didn't say actual scientists or astronomers, are now agreed on the existence of a belt of highly charged energy centered on the Pleiades star system, an estimated 500 light years from the Earth. It is from here that much channeled information which feels right to me is purported to come. I believe that the Pleiades, maybe in our future, is a base for the positive extraterrestrial support we are being given at this time, and quite possibly the home of extraterrestrials who have abused the Earth and humanity too. Paul Otto Hesse claimed to have discovered a belt of immensely powerful energy, which he termed the photon belt. According to estimates, it takes his solar system 24,000, some say 26,000 years, to orbit the Pleiades and the star reckoned to be at the center of the belt, figure 17, known as Alcyon. Again, there is much ancient legend across many cultures about this star. He continues, It would appear that we have reached the point when this solar system is entering the photon belt and its highly highly charged energy. The influence of the belt on the Earth began in the early 1960s and affected the thinking of many people, but it was as nothing compared to what will happen over the next 35 years. While it takes 2,000 years to pass fully through the belt, the biggest impact is when we first enter, and the vibrations and molecular structure of everything has to cope with the dramatically changing conditions. This will affect the thinking, behavior, and physical bodies of all life forms. He concludes by saying the effect of the photon belt is activating data stored in our consciousness and our physical bodies. He says knowledge is being unlocked from the cells, bones, and our DNA, which will eventually be restored to its 12-stranded potential. Now you can see that if this were true, it would be a great find to support the idea of a coming spiritual evolution that Ike and Alice Bailey and Michael Tessarian and all these spiritual entities are trying to get us to believe. But the problem is, is that all this science that these entities told us is not true. 
Even the basic math shows this to be impossible. Our solar system and that of Alcyon are both orbiting around the galactic center. It takes us about 226 million years to go around one time, and that's at 486,000 miles per hour. If our solar system was also orbiting around Alcyon while it was also revolving around the center of the galaxy, it would need to be going much faster than the speed in which we are currently moving. One scientist said it this way. The math doesn't work, he says. Alcyon is 400 light years from Earth. If the Sun was orbiting Alcyon in 250,000 years, it would have to have an orbital speed of 3,142 kilometers a second, which is 14 times faster than the Sun is currently orbiting the galactic center. This would be readily apparent if it were so. Another way of expressing this is that if the Sun was orbiting Alcyon at the same speed as it goes around the galactic center, and if there were such a lesser orbit that it would probably be much slower, then it would take either 3.5 million years instead of 250,000 years, or Alcyon would have to be only 28 light years from Earth instead of 400. Besides, our movement has been measured against the background of stars on numerous occasions, and scientists have found no trace of such an orbit. And this is only the beginning of this theory's problems. Alcyon and the Pleiades Cluster are stars no more than 100 million years old, one-fortieth the age of the Earth, much younger than our solar system. Alcyon would not even have been there when our Sun began such an orbit, and that in itself is a pretty persuasive argument against this theory. And the so-called anomaly in the Pleiades Cluster is a nebula. It's made up of plasma and gas, not photons. Photons are light, and light doesn't gather in clouds like that. Nebulas are remnants of supernovas, and they diffuse over time, and therefore wouldn't even be expected to be there if we were orbiting it in a cycle of 26,000 years. The core of the Pleiades cluster is approximately 8 light years across. The Sun, and with it the Earth, is moving away from Alcyon. This should be the final nail in the coffin of this theory. So, these entities are either really bad with science, or they are intentionally deceiving us to believe in a Hitler-esque fifth root race spiritual evolution. We will look at the possible motives for that theory in the next and final section, but for now I want to propose a theory about what these beings are. Most of you will recoil at my suggestion that these are demons, but before you do, I think that the science of anthropology will help us to see that every culture has agreed on demons existing and on their basic characteristics. For instance, of them being very evil. For example, the Sumerians could not even agree if their gods were good or evil, but they were unanimous that the demons they dealt with were very evil. Cultures around the world have described possession by these evil entities in their writings, as well as demons being very deceptive and manipulative. The methods for summoning them are consistent, certain drugs or rituals or tools like runes or chants, it's interesting to note that the methods for making contact are ultimately based on the free will of the practitioner. What I mean by that is that according to basic demonology, demons require an invitation. Although they sometimes manipulate the person through deception into giving them that invitation. Take a Ouija board for example. It's just cardboard and paint but those that decide to use it are essentially asking to be contacted by spirits. And that's all the spirits need. Your willingness to be contacted. Your free will. So let's look at David's testimony to see if we can get any idea if he's dealing with demons instead of ascended Atlanteans trying to help humanity evolve. Suddenly um, I felt over 1989 that there was a, a presence in the room whenever I was alone. Um, and it became more and more tangible as 1989 unfolded. It was bizarre, really, because whenever I was in a room alone, like a hotel room or something, there was this presence, you know. And eventually, um, uh, it got so powerful towards the end of 89 that I was sitting on the side of a bed in a, in a hotel called the Kensington Hilton in London, just down from the BBC I know. headquarters. And I said to this apparently empty room, look, if there's something there, would you please contact me because you'll drive me up the wall. Let's stop right there for now. Notice how all this began with a desire to be contacted. Also note that David will later go on to basically preach that this is all that must be done for anyone to be contacted. 
All we've got to say, and it's very simple, is I accept that I am being guided, I have guides in other frequencies, other dimensions of life, who are here to guide me and help me through this lifetime so that I learn the lessons I decided I wish to learn. Go ahead and guide me. And when you do that, things start happening. He says on page 139 of Love Changes Everything, quote, Every single life form can be a part of this transformation if they say openly, I wish to be guided and work for the light. Notice that he capitalizes the word light. On page 156, he quotes the entities which told him, quote, Always ask for protection and guidance. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. But then they say, you must make the first move. You need to exercise your free will. They tell him at the end of the book, quote, Welcome all beings. If you do this, you're welcoming creation into your life. It is also interesting to note the negative effect that even pictures of Jesus began to have on him. In his book Truth Vibrations, he says this about a visit he made to a church as a tourist. Quote, Looking up at a large painting of Christ, the picture suddenly turned black and moved around before my eyes. Only the face of Christ was still. Suddenly, I felt a sensation I can only describe as someone pushing a pneumatic drill into the top of my head. I gripped the pew I was standing beside, and my body vibrated from the top of my head to the base of my spine as something seemed to go through me. He says that months later, he was told that he received a gift of energy from one of the ascended masters of the planetary system at this point. Interesting that revulsion towards Jesus is actually quite observable among these entities. I would even go so far as to say that it's empirically testable in our modern times. I've had a unique opportunity to work with hundreds of cases of sleep paralysis through a website a friend and I started called StopSleepParalysis.org. Sleep paralysis is when one wakes up and can't move, but they are fully awake it is most often associated with the feeling that there is some evil presence in the room. Over time, during the experiences, the presence can become more manifest in some form and can lead to very terrible cases of torture and even rape. This is attributed to demons in almost every culture in the world except for modern Western cultures like America. A few examples are in Fiji, the experience is interpreted as kana tevoro, or being eaten or possessed by a demon. In the Hamang culture, sleep paralysis is described as an experience called dab swam, or crushing demon. In Malaysia, Africa, Hungary, the Middle East, and everywhere in between, these events are attributed to evil spirits. Western scientists do not have an explanation. They postulate, with no evidence I would add, that it is happening because people are coming out of a dream state and into a waking state, and that their mind is still dreaming even though they have awoken. I suppose the obvious question is, if that were true, why does everyone seem to be having the same dream about an evil presence in the room? It seems that the dreams should be as varied as the dreams normally are among people, but this is not the case. In the cases that I have seen, about 90-95% to of the people experiencing this have been dabbling in some occult or new age practice, and they have in some way given their free will over to these entities, who now apparently feel that they have a right to be there. The more a person goes down that road, the more intense the control of these entities gets. Now here is the observable and testable part of this. If a person genuinely calls upon Jesus for help, the experience will immediately stop. Very often, the entities will scream or be thrown back. One of the interesting aspects to this is it doesn't appear that a person has to be a Christian to do this, or to have previously believed that Jesus was important in some way. In fact, as you can guess, many of the people who are getting this are not Christians at all. But most of them who do see this authority that the name of Jesus has over these beings that they've been dealing with for so long, do begin to research who he is and why his name is so important. Now this doesn't work with other names, interestingly. For instance, calling on Buddha, no matter how sincere the person is, doesn't seem to concern these entities. There would be another time in Ike's life when he would vibrate uncontrollably like he did when looking at that picture of Jesus. This was when he took his infamous trip to Peru. He tells the story this way. Uh, I had this overwhelming feeling, again, the uh, urge, the impulse, to go to Peru. And we go out to this place, and it's in the middle of nowhere. And basically, when you looked around, um, it was encircled by mountains in the distance, mind. And I'm looking out the window, daydreaming. And I, look at, I see this mound to my right, but it must be no more than three minutes down the road. And as I look at the mound, 
all I can hear in my head is come to me, come to me, come to me, come to me, come to me. And I walk to the center of the circle and suddenly my feet go again, like they did in the new shop, but only seriously more powerful. This, like, they're like magnets pulling my feet to the ground. And I think, oh crikey, I recognize that, here we go. And then I felt like a drill going in the top of my head and through my body, through my feet into the ground, and then another one coming the other way. And then my arms go out at 45 degrees like that. I never made any decision to do it. And what then started to happen is this energy coming through me, this is um, February 1991, um, got more and more powerful. My body started to shake with it. Very powerful thought forms just passed through my head, just like in the new shop. It was like, you know, if you've got a, a dam and it's holding the water back, well, the water is calm, right? Because that's its, that's its natural state in that situation, if you like. But when the dam bursts, before a new balance is found um, after the dam bursts, all hell breaks loose mm -hmm. in the water, right? As it's trying to go from one state to another. Yep. When I look back, what happened to me on that mound? It was like um, the waters of my mind bursting. Ike always attributes this event to this place in Peru being located near a vortex point in something he calls the energy grid. But there is another side to that story. I used to believe in the idea of ley lines myself. I had no reason to doubt it. After all, all the so-called teachers I had in the truth movement talked about it as if it was a long-established fact. But I encourage anyone to do some research about how this idea started and see if you can still force yourself to believe it after that. There is actually a very interesting history of its evolution, and I will provide links in the notes where you can get all the details on this to get you started with the research. I say this because many people will claim that a proof that a ley line exists is the fact that certain places, especially ancient ritual sites, have a very heavy feeling of energy. I would validate that, but let me offer an alternate theory, one that I think is based on a much more observable cause. Ike would say that the reason that people were sacrificing on these ancient sites is because they were on powerful spots in the energy grid, and these people were adding negativity to it to affect world consciousness, and that's why the place feels negative. But I would say, based on my understanding of satanic rituals, that the areas are not intrinsically special at all. It is simply by it being the place where a lot of blood is spilled and sacrifice that it draws the presence of these evil spirits to the place. And that is why the area feels negative, as a result of their presence. Let me see if my theory helps us to understand what happened to Ike in Peru. But first let me describe a little about the area that he was visiting. The area that Ike was in was known for its blood sacrifice. New human sacrificial sites turn up all the time in Peru from the pre-Incan and Incan civilizations, especially that of small children. In fact, the place that Ike talks about in this clip was a place called Silistani, where there are stone channels that lead down to the lake so that the blood of the sacrifices could flow from the sacrificial site to the lake. Ironically, there is also a lizard engraved at the site too, and they still sacrifice pregnant iguanas there to this day. There is a stone circle on the mound there, which is exactly like the one, three minutes down the road, where Ike says his Kundalini experience was. This area was full of these stone circles on mounds, and I would suggest to you, based on his description of his convulsions and on him hearing voices of beings in his head on a daily basis after this, that he was further controlled by the entities at this point. Then there is the story of his experience in Brazil with the drug ayahuasca. In 2003, when I had an ayahuasca experience in um, Brazil, and a voice talked to me for five hours about the nature of reality, real clear, very funny, and uh, mind-blowing and uh, life-changing. Ayahuasca is a DMT-containing drug, which is naturally produced in the pineal gland, and is present in wild plants found in places like the Amazon Basin, and has been used for millennia by aboriginal shamans and medicine men to contact the spirit world and to receive information from entities there. It is common for adjoining DMT partakers to see the same apparition. 
Psychologist Dr. Rick Strassman conducted a formal clinical study of DMT ingestion under the auspices of the University of New Mexico, which he detailed in his book, DMT, The Spirit Molecule. He found, under controlled clinical conditions, that subjects had these experiences within seconds of ingesting DMT, which almost universally mimicked what are described elsewhere as alien abduction events. Note that these subjects were screened to be those who were not familiar with stories of UFOs or did not believe in them. The entities they encountered were typically described as traditional greys, reptilian, or insect-like. The context usually involved medical and reproductive experiments conducted by the entities on the subjects, described as violent rape episodes. When subjects were willing to try additional experiences, they reported that the entities acknowledged their prior disappearance with no sensation of time loss. The episodes were so traumatic to the subjects that a support group was later formed to help them deal with the emotional trauma of the experiences. I would ask you to remember the quote from Terence McKenna warning us about these entities. He had more experience with this drug than most people, and as much as he enjoyed talking about it, recall that he always described the so-called elves he came into contact with as, quote, mischievous, which is a more sugar-coated version of the descriptions that I have heard from people who have taken it, who simply call these beings evil. And I'm sure not everybody's experience is bad, but here's the question we should ask about these entities that show up when we take drugs like this. Should we assume that the entities that are talking about love are good? Or based on the fact that the negative ones obviously exist and are contacted by the exact same means, can we be skeptical of the positive ones as well? In fact, how do we know that the so-called good ones we encounter aren't simply pretending to be good? Especially, as in Ike's case, if the voice is clearly describing the same doctrine that Alice Bailey's ascended masters have been trying to teach us from the beginning, this idea of spiritual evolution. I think that the biggest problems we have in the truth movement are, one, we have no idea that everything we believe, we were made to believe, by people carrying the message of these entities. And two, because we don't really understand what their end game is, or why they are so diligent with this deception, it makes us powerless to defend against it. We don't even know what it is they're trying to ultimately do. We find ourselves wanting to believe what they want us to believe, and we never have realized that we are being led like sheep to the slaughter to what I like to call the new, new world order. Let me introduce you to the real plan of the Illuminati. The one thing that has never changed in Ike's teaching is the idea of the coming evolution of humanity. One of the themes at that time, we're talking 1990, was that <clears throat> there was a consciousness shift coming. I kept meeting psychic people a lot in those days, and they kept saying, I'm getting something, I'm being told to tell you this, and again and again it was, there's a consciousness shift coming. There is an awakening coming. And now as the, as the 90s have become uh, the, the new century, more and more this stuff about this, this shift is uh, going on. This also happens to be the central thesis to theosophy, the mother of the New Age movement. In fact, the very term, New Age is referring to a coming time of spiritual evolution. This fact alone should show you how the idea of a spiritual evolution is the only idea that matters to these beings. We've already looked at some of the reasons why Ike thinks the idea of a coming spiritual evolution is valid. One is because he believes the photons from the photon belt will change us, and alternatively, he believes that the galactic logos will send its seven rays through the sun god and change our DNA into a better evolution. Despite these flimsy premises, Ike is absolutely convinced that nothing can stop this from happening. I'm absolutely convinced that the end of this prison society is a done deal. I think the outcome is going to happen, I think it's meant to happen, and um, uh, we're now seeing, and it will go on for a while, but we're now seeing the last throes of a dying um, system. You also have to understand that we are being promised a utopia in no uncertain terms. He says, quote, beyond the turmoil of transformation awaits a new dawn for all life forms on this planet. We will live in a world of love and peace and harmony, a world which the extremes of today and the recent past will give way to a level of understanding, wisdom, 
love that we could not begin to understand on this low and troubled frequency. The first problem that emerges is that this is sounding a lot like what those that write about a new world order talk about. In fact, this chapter comes from a chapter entitled New World in Ike's Love Changes Everything. But what some people miss is that the new world order really does plan to bring order out of chaos. It is supposed to rise out of the ashes of what will appear to be a great change in paradigm. That is why Manly P. Hall called it the New Atlantis. They intend for their system to look like a utopia. And they intend for people who currently fight them and resist world government to think that the old system that they have been fighting has been defeated. And they intend for them to embrace what will look like a utopia and their victory. Alice Bailey said it best when she wrote, The new world order must be appropriate to a world which has passed through a destructive crisis and to humanity which is badly shattered by the experience. The new world order must lay the foundation for a future world order which will be possible only after a time of recovery, reconstruction, and of rebuilding. Notice in this next quote that she considers the current system, which is obviously still controlled by them, just the preparatory New World Order. She says, In the preparatory period for the New World Order, there will be a steady and regulated disarmament. It will not be optional. No nation will be permitted to produce and organize any equipment for destructive purposes or to infringe the security of any other nation. She also says, the present world order, which is today largely disorder, can be so modified and changed that a new world and a new race of men can gradually come into being. Renunciation and the use of the sacrificial will should be the keynote for the interim period after the war, prior to the inauguration of the new age. In a writing called Preparations Until 2025, she made some very revealing statements. She says, This must form the theme of all propaganda work to be done during the next few decades until the year 2025, a brief space of time indeed to produce fundamental changes in human thought, awareness, and direction, but at the same time, a quite possible achievement provided the new group of world servers and the men and women of goodwill perform a conscientious task. What was this new group supposed to teach? I find this one particularly interesting. It says, The day is dawning when all religions will be regarded as emanating from one great spiritual source. All will be seen as unitedly providing the one root out of which the universal world religion will inevitably emerge. And this final quote that I find particularly interesting, considering that it is the one thing that Ike has consistently done through every manifestation, the last few pages of every book that he has ever written explains this message, the one that Alice Bailey says emphasis must be put on. She says, quote, emphasis should be laid on the evolution of humanity. There is also a very dark side to Ike's spiritual utopia something that I've previously only alluded to. Not everyone is invited to the utopia, and those that refuse to conform to this new system will be eliminated. This is much more apparent when you read other channeled writings about this. In the book of co-creation, New Age leader Barbara Marks Hubbard states, quote, Out of the full spectrum of human personality, one-fourth is electing to transcend, one-fourth is resisting to election, they are unattracted by life ever evolving. Now, as we approach the quantum shift from creature human to co-creative human, the destructive one-fourth must be eliminated from the social body. Fortunately, you, dearly beloveds, are not responsible for this act. We are. We are in charge of God's selection process for the planet Earth. He selects, we destroy. We are the riders of the pale horse death. Alice Bailey explained what the New World Order would do to those who refuse to accept its utopia. She says, Let us never forget that it is the life, its purpose, and its directed intentional destiny that's of importance, and also that when a form proves inadequate, or too diseased or too crippled for the expression of that purpose, it is, from the point of view of the hierarchy, no disaster when that form has to go. Death is not a disaster to be feared. The work of the destroyer is not really cruel or undesirable. Therefore, there is much destruction permitted by the custodians of the plan, and much evil turned to good. In his chapter, New World, Ike says, 
I do not seek to hide the severity of this period of fundamental change. It will be tough for every one of us. Many will return to the light levels, or die, in the wake of the physical events and the quickening vibrations. The earth spirit is already raising up the subplanes, and through the years ahead, she will progress through the whole frequencies in her journey back to Atlantis and beyond. Those who cannot quicken their own vibrations through love and balance will find themselves out of synchronization with the environment around them. This process is already apparent. As the vibrations of a being fall behind those of their planet, it manifests in physical, mental, and emotional imbalances, and such people will need all the love there is to give. Their behavior will be unpredictable and sometimes unpleasant and inexplicable. Those who cannot at this time rise with the climbing subplanes and frequencies will eventually return to the light levels or die and be surrounded by love and indescribable warmth and power. They will assess their progress and decide how they wish to proceed on their path of evolution. Ike also says later in the book, And the Truth Shall Set You Free, quote, Others who follow the propaganda of the global elite and the prison warder consciousness will cling to the old vibration. In their desperation to find security, they will become even more vehement in their religious, political, and economic dogma. They will resist the rising vibrations if they choose that path, and this will have mental, emotional, and physical effects. The two states of being, the programmed mind and the open mind, will be more obvious with every month to those who know what's happening. And not just that, but according to Ike, these people that are hanging on to the old age are going to actually prevent the rest of the people from getting their evolution. He says, quote, We are now entering a period of fantastic change, and the happening of events are speeding up all the time. We have two challenges here in front of us. People have to get access to that information and start to realize who they really are and the nature of life. Then we can go into a stage two, which is the incredible consciousness shift that is going to happen and is happening with many people already, but can happen for everybody if we open up to the knowledge of what's going on. And to do that, the edifice of suppression must go. What I see so often in the New Age movement is that they are focusing on the second, but they're in denial of the first. And the second is not going to happen for many people unless we remove the suppression. Now here's a thought that has disturbed me for a while now. Obviously, the idea of spiritual evolution is being pushed by the global elite and these entities. And I suppose that it could lead to a world government, but only if the entire world was in on it. What I mean is that right now, only the New Age and the so-called truth movement, which has now been converted to the New Age, believe the spiritual evolution stuff. And sure, the idea is expanding, thanks to shock value things like the 2012 stuff, but still, it would have to be believed by the entire world, not just a few. They would have to be passionate about the idea of spiritual evolution for this to work. Now, let Mr. Ike explain how this could all change overnight. What I, would, what I would say very strongly, and it's coming more and more into my life, there is an X factor, which um, I don't understand yet, but I sure as hell know is there. And it's an X factor which is going to um, bring an end to this uh, childish playground nonsense of human control. Um, Do you mean an external influence? There's something. Something. I'm absol I absolutely, at a deep level, I know it. I'd say, and I'm probably being optimistic, I'd say we, we would live in a global version of Nazi Germany within 10 years, if we take that route. Mm -hmm. If we take that route, we'll, in 10 years' time, be um, deeply into a transition to a very different world. It's just a choice. But this X factor is going to help us to, um, to change the world to one that I would like to live in. I don't know what the X Factor is, but I know it's coming. No uh, my, one's going to do it for us, right? Well, my feeling is that there's an X Factor. Um, I don't think myself that humanity can do it alone because the program is so deep and the pressure to go the other way, to hold on to the hack, is so uh, powerful to people who or in mind, alone, that I, I think what 
we can do is change enough so that we stop adding to the problem but I think there's an X factor I think and I think that there are things going on now outside of our awareness and on much higher levels of consciousness than we are aware of which is also supporting this change notice what the function of the X factor is he says that the programming to hold us all into the old ways is too strong but the X factor this external thing will shatter that paradigm and set us free from our old way of thinking and it will give us a new paradigm let me suggest a possible X factor that people like Bill Cooper have suggested and one that I think without question we are being prepared for by the global elite and have been for at least 70 years that is an extraterrestrial presence being discovered now, I realize that Cooper presented documents that reveal a plan of the New World Order to use an alien threat to cause patriotism needed for world government. After all, people would no longer view themselves as separate countries, but instead a world family. Now, this would also create the need for a world bureaucracy to deal with the threat. But I think that based on the propaganda of Hollywood and the occult writings, that this might not be presented as a threat at all, but rather them posing as a savior to a world that will be war-torn. They will claim to be saving us from ourselves. They will claim to have genetically created mankind. They will claim that they used to be like us and that we are on the verge of an evolution. Now, suspend your disbelief for a moment as I explain how this would serve as Ike's X-Factor and the catalyst for his utopia and the real New World Order to begin all at the same time. First, it would accomplish the primary thing that Ike says we need to do in order to shift with the planet, that is, to destroy the religions of all types. All over the world, religions would be in turmoil. Here these aliens are claiming to have created us. That means they're claiming to be our god in a sense. Overnight, the programming that Ike says is too powerful, the religious programming that is holding us back from the shift, would be shattered. All the religions would be forced to reconsider their ideas. Secondly, it would finally get the idea of a possible spiritual evolution to the entire world. Everyone across the world, from the smallest village to the largest city, would have a really good reason to believe that they too could be evolved. They could become like the aliens. They could become actual gods. Overnight, the X Factor could turn the entire world into little David Ikes, believing their evolution was just around the corner. And of course, people would believe that the world government utopia was possible then. But it would be best if this came after a time of war, like when Alice Bailey said that the new world order must be appropriate to a world which has passed through a destructive crisis and to a humanity which is badly shattered by the experience. Now here's why. We need to be convinced that the utopia that we will be asked to join is totally different than the old system. For us truther types, we will need to be convinced that the New World Order has been defeated in order to trust such a utopia. The regular people will only have to be convinced that the new system, since it will be based on non-religious ideas now because the aliens showed us that the religions were wrong, will be one where there will be no more wars. That will be the promise. The war that we were saved from initially by them must be made to look like the epitome of religious wars. It will be something that pins the Jews against the Muslims, which will draw in the so-called Christians. The world will be convinced that the previous war was all about religion. Our revulsion of that idea and our desire never to go back to it will be like the Treaty of Versailles times 100. Alice Bailey said, Only universal disaster could have brought men to a state of mind wherein such propositions and solutions could be presented. The general recognition that the old order has lamentably failed is most valuable. The new world order will seem to have been defeated. We will rejoice in our new hope of utopia, and we will badly need it. We will be told to await our newfound powers, but when they don't come, we will be told that it is because there are some still among us that are keeping us from it, those that are still hanging on to the old age. All of this makes what Ike says in this clip very concerning. But we're now seeing the last throes of a dying um, system um, where the Illuminati in their box 
are believing they're crashing the system to create something else when it's actually crashing ultimately for another reason. Understand what he's saying here. He's admitting that they are crashing the system to create something else. This idea should be common knowledge to all of us who study them. They are going to be the solution to the problem that they create. And Ike, of course, knows this. After all, he's Mr. Problem Reaction Solution. But listen carefully to what he's saying. He believes that his utopia will arise out of their ashes. And for some reason, their utopia won't rise. In effect, he's saying that when the system crashes, he is expecting his utopia to rise, but they are expecting a utopia to rise too. Now, how are we supposed to know that the utopia we get after this crash is the one that Ike is talking about, instead of the one that they've been planning to bring about for so long? Or probably the better question is, are these utopias one and the same thing? They certainly sound the same. What a dangerous game this is. They will say that there are still people who don't trust this new utopia and that they will have to be eliminated for everyone else's benefit. These people will be primarily Christians because there are prophecies specifically mentioning a great deception that will seem to offer peace, but that it will only last three and a half years before it shows its true colors. All the other religions will find it easy to agree with this new system. This, in addition to the propaganda that Christianity is behind all the wars of the past, will convince the entire world of these words of Aleister Crowley, who was given this message from a being claiming to be an Egyptian god. Quote, but the future is now and the maneuvers are being unveiled. As far as Christianity's role in this new age, Carpenter states, Christianity, therefore, as I say, must either now come frankly forward and acknowledge its parentage from the great order of the past, seek to rehabilitate that, and carry mankind one step forward in the path of evolution, or else it must perish. There is no alternative. Or, as new age author Eckhart Tolle likes to say, evolve or die. We've been told by Ike, a man definitely possessed by something, that if we worship the God of the Bible, we are worshiping reptilians. And when you, when you worship, you project energy. And you are feeding this force by thinking you are worshiping a God when you're worshiping these. He has changed his mind in every book that he's written about which way to tell you not to look towards Jesus and not to look at the Bible. His entities have told him to tell us that demons don't exist. The voice that talked to him for five hours in Brazil went on quite a tirade about how demons don't exist. How could they, after all, if everything was an illusion? There is a fabulous reason why this misdirection is happening. Because the real agenda is being played out like a military system. These demons are influencing people to prepare the way for what the New World Order calls its phoenix. And what the Theosophical Society calls the World Teacher their Christ, what I would call the Antichrist. A genuine Satanist knows exactly what I'm talking about right now, and that this plan has been the plan all along. They are awaiting something they call the Black Awakening, when this system of the Antichrist will begin. Alice Bailey said, The widespread expectation that we approach the age of Maitreya, when the world teacher and present head of the spiritual hierarchy, the Christ, will reappear among humanity to sound the keynote of the new age. There are millions of mentally alert men and women in all parts of the world who are on rapport with the plan and work to give it expression. They provide opportunity for cooperation with the spiritual evolution of humanity. There is no group so likely to ensure that humanity achieves this most difficult goal as the men and women of goodwill requiring only courage to initiate action to prepare for the new world order. All the conspiracies, all of them, are leading up to one event. There is an ancient angel that has been working on a system that would allow him to actually control the world to such a degree that he could force them to worship him as God. And unfortunately, for the first time in history, technology is now capable of doing that. I believe that the implantable microchip could actually play a role in this worship. And he is the general in all of this. This is why you find Satanism behind every door you kick down in the investigation of the New World Order. This is why you find his demons telling people to go out on a world stage and teach a doctrine that will lead them right into his hands. To an elitist mindset, seeking the Luciferic initiation of the Lightbringer, 
Prometheus, Lucifer, the Solar Logos. They've always been preparing you for him. Their agenda has never changed. But we have been so brainwashed to hate Christianity that the Bible is literally the last place we would look for the truth. Jesus spoke of a time that's coming, and he said, Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father the son, and children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Now this is interesting. Here's a guy that not even his enemies can find a good reason to accuse him. He's entirely just and sincere and humble in the Bible. Yet for some unknown reason, what he said is absolutely true. We will be hated for his namesake. This hate has to come from a third party. Our enemy perverts the Bible to make you think that religion is equal with Jesus, so that you will reject him. And I submit to all of you that Jesus was the most anti-religious person that ever walked the face of the earth. He had nothing but compassion for sinners. In fact, the only harsh thing he ever said was to the clergy of his day and the bankers. The reason the mere calling on his name crushes whatever force is behind sleep paralysis and so-called alien abductions is because he really is who he claimed to be. And the demons are just as scared of him now as they were during the pages of the Bible. Jesus said in Matthew 11, verse 28, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Christianity is not a belief system. It's a supernatural event that happens to you. Your life begins to change. You start to love things you used to hate and hate things you used to love. You are given a new power to turn from the things that have you in chains. It doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect, but you will start to change, and that change will continue your whole life. It is freedom from bondage, not a list of rules. Mark 10 verse 45 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Acts 17.30 says, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. I do not think that David Icke knows that he is being used as a tool for the new world order. I would like to think that he would turn from this if he could be convinced of it. I want to ask you to help me pray for Mr. Ike. For transcripts, footnotes, free downloads, and free DVDs, go to the website davidikedebunked.com. Thanks for your time.